Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Wednesday, November 22nd. We will all rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to be led by Caitlin Helmkamp, a fourth grader at Sussex Elementary School. We will remain standing for a moment of silent meditation in memory of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And to the Republican, for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Our first item for the meeting tonight is our agenda. Uh, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Uh, there are none. Thank you, Dr. Dance. And board, just for um, a point of order, I would like to move item G up, which recognizes our students and the artwork, uh, up to I after item D, if you would agree to. Okay. All right, thank you. thank you. So uh, our agenda has been moved and second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, our, our agenda is approved. Our next item is our selection of speakers for this evening. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled meet meeting to 10. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to discuss his or her issue. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed into the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. If fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. Ms. Bratt. One. Two. Three. The first speaker is June Keating. The second speaker is Rona Cobell. Three. The third speaker is Shuli Mja. Four. Next is Timothy Dodge. Five. Number five is Chris Miller. Six. The sixth speaker is Aaron Witt. Hilker. Seven. Number seven, Kathy Forbes. Eight. Number eight, Bosch Farone. Nine. Number nine is Brooks Morales. Ten. And the tenth speaker is folded up. That is Linda Penn. Thank you very much. So we'll hear from them uh, a little later. Okay, as I just mentioned, uh, we're going to, uh, at this time, cover item G, which is a special order of business, uh, our student artwork. The Board of Education publishes the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, CAFR, each year, and student artwork is included in the CAFR. The fiscal year 2015 CAFR includes the work of elementary and middle school students, and these students are recognized at the board meeting when the CAFR is presented to the board. Each participating student receives a gift certificate to Barnes & Noble Bookstore. So um, at this time, I'm going to call forward a number of our students that are here from Pinewood Elementary School. We have Alex Kim, a second grader, and uh, the, his art teacher, Mr. Sheldon Gruber. From Colgate Elementary, we have Jacqueline Chikas, uh, uh, a, a fourth grader, and an art teacher, Miss Laura Marvin Basta. From Featherbed Elementary, Madison Gaither, uh, who's a third grader, and the art teacher, Miss Joan Mikowitz, and for Harvard Hills Elementary, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, Al Alanya Underwood, a kindergartner, and the art teacher, Miss Jennifer Massaros, from Warren Elementary, 
Jalen Alexander, a fifth grader, and his principal, Mr. Jason Barnett. From Glendon Elementary, Gabriel Perales, a second grader, and uh, the art teacher, Mr. Al Mr. Allard. From Sparks Elementary, we have Juliet O'Neill, a fifth grader, and the art teacher, Miss Stephanie Cheney, and from Sussex Elementary, Kaylin Hel Helmkamp, who led us in the Pledge of Allegiance, a third grader, and her principal, Mr. Thomas Bowser. So if they would come forward, uh, we have some, and Dr. Dance and Mr. Gillis maybe can come up and help in, in the recognition. Madison Gaither, Miss. Underwood. Aliana Underwood. Congratulations, Miss. Way to go. Good work. Thank you for your work. Yeah, Jalen Alexander. Mr. Jalen Alexander. He's okay. He's not here. Gabriel Perales. Gabriel Perales. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. Great work. Great work. Congratulations. Juliet O'Neill. Juliet O'Neill. Miss O'Neill, congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations to you. Way to go, Juliet. Caitlin Helmkamp. And Caitlin, I know who you are. Caitlin Helmkamp. Congratulations. Great job. Great job. Let's give a big round to all our artists here. Thank you very much. Oh, come on up. We're going to take a picture. Come on up here. And right up here. Congratulations, everyone. Want to get a nice picture of you all, okay? There you go. So, Bobby, come on up to the table. I think we're going to come right over here. I'm not. <laughs> I'm like shorter. Excuse me. I want to have to back up just a little bit here. All right, everybody. We need a big smile. Ready? One, two, three. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Go. All right, we'll move into our public comment portion of the meeting. This is, this is one of the opportunities we provide to hear views and receive the advice of our community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens and will take your comments into consideration. Even though it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues which are raised. When appropriate, we will refer your con concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. I would like to remind the public the inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe our timer, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that your time has expired. 
At this time, we'll start off this evening with um, our stakeholder groups. And our first speaker for this uh, evening is from the Baltimore County Student Council, Ms. Jordan Wilson. Hello, Jordan. Hello, all. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, so my name is Jordan Wilson. I am the president of the Baltimore County Student Council, as some of you guys know, but not everybody here tonight does know that. Um, so I just wanted to say that throughout the process of rolling out the new grading policy, um, students, parents, teachers, and administrators have all expressed some concerns while also acknowledging new benefits. Uh, while there was some confusion at first, I would like to thank Berlita White um, and all the members of the Grading and Reporting Committee as well as the entire Board of Education. Um, you all met with me and other students and faculty members on numerous occasions to discuss our initial reactions and concerns. Uh, many students and teachers felt that there was some confusion over what assignments were to be graded as well as how much of the grade these assignments should make up. Um, but to address these concerns, Mrs. White and her team are working to provide examples of what constitutes a body of evidence in order to better assist teachers as they navigate these changes. Um, Dr. Danz and Ms. White, you both expressed the need for grades to reflect a mastery of content um, and for an A in class in one school to be the same as an A in a class in another school, which we all find very important. Um, you also addressed student concerns that large tests were dominating their grades and a single 100-point assignment could ruin an entire quarter. Um, with the addition of Addendum A, teachers now have a guideline showing that approximately one-third of a quarter grade should make up and be comprised of these major assignments, while the other two-thirds uh, should be comprised of the assignments that are leading up to this and that show the mastery of that content. Um, Lastly, they discuss the importance of teachers utilizing the data on how their students perform an assignment to decide whether or not they should focus on reteaching or should move on to the next units. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to Verlita White, the Grading and Reporting Committee, Dr. Dance, and the entire Board of Education uh, for working so closely with students to aid in this transition. There is always more work to be done whenever a major change such as this is put in place, and I hope that the student voice will continue to be taken into consideration as it has been thus far. Um, as for news of BCSC, uh, we just hosted a huge conference on Saturday in conjunction with Hereford High School. The conference hosted over 600 students from all around the state of Maryland, and it was a huge success, and I know that everybody took a lot out of it, and it was an incredible opportunity for all of us. Um, I do want to say a special thank you to George Roberts, who came out to join us on Saturday morning. Um, so thank you all very much for the opportunity to speak, and have a great evening. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wilson. All right, um, our next speaker is Ms. Abby Baton from the president of TABCO. Good evening. I would like to ask the teachers that are in there to come in while I'm speaking, please. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. First, I would like to take this opportunity to thank outgoing board member Mike Collins for his hard work and dedication to BCPS. <coughs> Every one of us understands he has always had the backs of the teachers and students of Baltimore County. Even if he is a little biased toward a particular high school in the <laughs> county, we always knew he was passionate and cared about this system. We will miss your voice at the table. Enjoy your extra Tuesday nights from here on out. Mm -hmm. Some of our teachers have joined me here tonight to impress upon you how important we view our negotiations package. Many more couldn't join me because they are busy working on a whole array of tasks they need to complete daily, but want me to convey their support as well. We appreciate the nature of our negotiations. We have lively discussions and often come up with language that helps our teachers as they perform their craft. This year, with the problematic rollout of the grading and reporting manual and the many discipline issues in our schools, we are asking for language that will help ensure us that we are truly collaborative within the school system. Additionally, there is language concerning behavior included in our package. It is not that collaboration is being frowned on by BCPS officials. Rather, what collaboration should look like to be effective seems to, prove the most, to be proving the most difficult. Teachers did have input into the grading and reporting by way of focus groups. These teachers gave their ideas about what should be in the manual, but they played no part in writing it and very little in editing, editing it once it was written. For too long, we have been asked to be included in discussions and implementation plans to find we are put in focus groups or included after the rules or manuals are written. 
We are given the opportunity to stay, say what we think, but when the actual work is done, we are not in the room. We all know the devil is in the details. Who better to determine what will or won't work in the classrooms and schoolhouses than the teachers? We know that there will always be unintended consequences, but when we are part of the process, we can keep those consequences to a minimum. As an early childhood educator, I can speak to the myriad of issues about early childhood education, but I am not an expert in what a middle school English teacher may need to be successful with her students. Someone who has never taught art cannot fully understand the ramifications of various initiatives put into place for art teachers. We want the experts in the room so we can truly collaborate with the school system for the best results for our students and for our profession. We have a teacher shortage looming large in our nation. We already have difficulty here in Baltimore County filling all of our positions. In order to attract and retain our teachers, we must provide relief from the crushing time commitment that has become the teaching profession. Collaboration isn't the only answer, but it can go a long way to improve the outcomes for all. In addition, we are asking for more planning time for all teachers. Additional time beyond that for our special educators. Special educators have caseloads in addition to their planning for instruction that take additional time to complete. We simply cannot complete all the work during the little bit of planning time we have. Teachers know we have to work long hours outside the workday, but we can't continue to expect teachers to devote an entire lives to our profession. Our families deserve better. Thank you, Ms. Baden. All right, our next uh, speaker from our stakeholder groups is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, Ms. Hope Messenger Blaschek. She's caught up in traffic, I think. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. We were pleased to host the secondary transition panel at our November meeting. We welcomed community leaders as well as BCPS leaders who shared their programs with our committee. Amy Taubenfeld, the executive director of Itenerus Inc., along with Carrie Hubbard, who serves as the clinical director of Itenerus, um, joined us to share about their nonprofit organization, which provides person centered programs to individuals on the autism spectrum to develop skills needed to obtain a meaningful job in the field they enjoy. We were also pleased to have leaders within BCPS join our secondary transition panel, including Leanne Schubert, Director of Educational Options, Brian Stoll, Coordinator of Magnet Programs, Joyce Serio, Transition Team Leader, and Douglas Handy, Coordinator of Career and Technology Education. We were pleased that so many offices that play an integral role during our student secondary transition participated in our panel, and we look forward to working with each of them in the future as we examine how our special needs students can have equitable access to Magnet Programs in particular. CCAC encourages the board to increase staffing for the Office of Special Ed so that all of our students learn to thrive and succeed. CCAC appreciates the advocacy by Dr. Dance and the board for the 60 FTEs. While we're grateful for the 20 FTEs we received after budget cuts, we don't believe our special needs students should suffer from the aftermath of budget cuts. Please increase staffing so that we can teach all of our neurodiverse BCPS students to pursue excellence in all aspects of their lives. Elementary schools have been burdened with especially high caseloads of special needs students. This is devastating to classroom teachers, students, and special educators. Current staffing only affords a minimum of 1.5 FTE special educators in each elementary school in our county. This must be increased to a minimum of 2.0 FTE special educators so that our special needs students can have their needs as indicated on IEPs, 504s, and student support plans met with fidelity. 
Understaffing special educators is particularly dangerous for the special needs population that depends on these positions to deliver services that are required by legally binding individual education plans. We must deliver services to our neurodiverse students with fidelity. In order to do this, we must meet we must increase the number of special educators in our understaffed elementary schools to a minimum of 2.0 for the fiscal year 18 budget. This is absolutely critical for our students' success. CCAC would like to thank Dr. Dance for coming to our December meeting to hear our recommendations to improve special education services. We'd like to extend the invitations to the rest of the board for our next meeting on December 5th from 79 in this room to accompany Dr. Dance. We would love to share our recommendations, which we've been working on as an executive board and a community body since the summer break. All of our recommendations are aligned with Blueprint 2.0 and are broken down by age group of students, just as they were last year thanks to the leadership of Elisa Hartman and PJ Schaefer. Please join us on December 5th so that we can work collaboratively to improve special education services for students from birth through post-secondary. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Citizens Advisory for Gifted and Talented Education, Ms. Julie miller breitz Good evening, President McDaniels, board members, Dr. Dance, and the BCPS community. Good evening. As everyone's calendars start filling in with all the events of the holiday season, I want to alert you now to some upcoming dates and events that I invite you to pencil in so that you don't miss them. The GTCAC will have its next meeting on Wednesday, December 7th at 7 o'clock p.m. here in this room at Greenwood. Dr. Dance will be our guest and we will be sharing with him some advisory stances we've been developing in four different areas, communication, delivery of GT instruction, training and identification, and a framework for a flexible system-wide GT program. We invite members of the board and community members to our meeting. They are always open to the public and we really value community input. We hope to see you on December 7th. Another upcoming GTC meet, GTCAC meeting of note will be our meeting on February 1st. It will be held at Windsor Mill Middle School and our speaker for the evening will be Dr. Jonathan Plucker, Professor of Talent Development at Johns Hopkins School of Education. One of his areas of expertise is the excellence gap or the difference in the proportion of students in different demographic groups who score at the advanced level and student achievement tests. Evidence suggests that lower socioeconomic groups, black students, ELL students, and his Hispanic students are all underrepresented at the highest levels of academic achievement. Dr. Plucker will be speaking to this topic and more specifically on potential solutions as to how to reduce excellence gaps in education. Another important date to circle on your calendar is December 2nd, which is the date that nominations are due to MSDE for their annual eGate awards. They seek nominations on behalf of schools, teachers, administrators, counselors, and students who are doing great work in the sphere of gifted and talented education. Unfortunately, last year, no BCPS employees were recognized for an E-gate, and we would love to see that change this year since we know the district is full of talented individuals who are doing exceptional work to support these learners. I've included a link to the nomination form, which can also be found on our website at bcpsgtcac.wordpress.com. Finally, another date that is vitally important is the date when Policy 6401 will come before the board again. We were happy to meet last month with BCPS administration to discuss potential changes to this policy. However, the GTCAC still has not been given the opportunity to see drafts of revisions to 6401, despite asking for this repeatedly. In our view, this creates inefficiencies, unnecessary complications, and is contrary to having a productive working relationship. Looking at how legislation works in Annapolis shows that there is no prohibition for a legislative proposal not to be shared until it hits first reader stage, as it seems BCPS and the Board of Education are currently requiring. We continue to ask for access to the drafts and revisions of 6401 as work on this moves forward. Please let me know when, whom we need to follow up with on this matter. Best wishes for a happy Thanksgiving for everyone. I know the GTCAC is extremely thankful for all the highly competent, compassionate, and professional staff. We Thank you, Ms. Breeze. <laughs> Our next speaker is the president of CASE, Mr. Bill Lawrence.
Good evening, Mr. McDaniels, Mr. Mr. Lawrence, good evening. Dr. Dance, members of the board. Um, just a few things. First of all, I'd like to, Case would like to add, uh, with the thanks of a grateful nation, uh, our appreciation for the service of uh, teachers, sent delegates, senator, uh, board member, uh, Mike Collins. Uh, as has been noted, uh, this is close to 50 years of public service uh, for uh, Mr. Collins. And uh, as it was noted earlier, uh, despite his uh, occasional particular affinity for uh, one part of the county, uh, he certainly has always served uh, as an advocate for uh, children across Baltimore County. Um, just a couple of other things. First of all, thanks to the administration for re-inviting me to serve on the Grading and Reporting Committee. Um, principals and supervisors, et cetera, are in a difficult situation. We are asked to enforce, implement uh, a policy, and it is helpful uh, if we are part of that. There have been principals certainly uh, on the committee all along, but some of them are less likely to uh, ask the difficult and more challenging questions, and I, of course, don't have that problem. Um, secondly, or thirdly, I guess, ethics clarification. Um, we would ask the uh, superintendent and board and attorneys and whoever is in charge of that part of your organization uh, to give administrators clarity on the ethics findings uh, identified in the Baltimore Sun yesterday. Um, administrators are required to fill out uh, disclosure forms, and I certainly did when I worked for you. Um, but there are, is, seems to be some um, confusion about what exactly should be filled out and not filled out. You have dozens of your employees uh, who, do, who provide consulting work, who teach classes, uh, and whether or not they have all been compliant with what seems to be the direction of the Ethics Committee uh, would be very helpful. And it would be helpful that that be done in person as opposed to a webinar or that, that you know, with an example of the paper in front of them, people need to understand what their requirement is. They certainly don't want to be caught up in that. Uh, lastly, in my last 38 seconds, um, we had an annual meeting the other day and one of my, a couple of my administrators said that they were concerned about bringing teachers, parents, and kids to board meetings. Uh, felt that the board behavior had become a distraction. And I'm not talking here about dueling op-ed pieces. Um, I'm, I'm talking about just the general decorum. Uh, and I would just encourage you, uh, as you move forward, you are occasionally disrespectful to each other. You cast dispersions against professional educators who simply sit in this chair trying to provide the best possible service they can for the school system. Uh, lastly, uh, please enjoy uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, <laughs> we all have uh, more than enough uh, to be thankful for. Amen. Thank you. All right, we'll move into our public speaking portion of the meeting, and our first speaker is Ms. June Keating. Hello, my name is June Keating. I'm 15 years old, and I'm a 10th grader at Towson High School. Now, I'm not Dr. Dance's biggest fan, but after hearing some people's reactions to his retweet, I felt it was my responsibility as a BCPS student to speak up in his support. The post he retweeted called for love and support, not hatred, discrimination, or divisiveness. After this year's election, which left many non-white students in fear, I am very thankful that my superintendent did what he could to make them feel protected. I am a white BCPS student and I can say with 100% certainty that the tweet was not racist against myself or any other students. I fully support that the message that Dr. Dance is sending to educators, which is that we must show students of all races that we will protect them when their rights have been threatened. The rights of white students have not been threatened and therefore my superintendent was under no obligation to console them after the election. Having witnessed firsthand the fear being experienced by non-white students at my school, I am grateful to have a superintendent who is willing to address these issues in a peaceful way. 
Thank you. Our, our next speaker is uh, Rona Cobell. Can you hear me? Is that? Well, that's a tough act to follow, isn't it? <laughs> uh, my name is Rona Cobell. I'm a parent of two BCPS students. I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of myself and my children. As I understand it, we are here because a board member and a couple politicians and a group of parents seek to dismiss our superintendent, Dr. Dallas Dance, because he retweeted a message after the election to show empathy to black, Muslim, Latino, Jewish, disabled, or just non-white students. The tweet may have been a tad inartful. The sentiment, however, was spot on. During this last election, here's what students had to endure at the hands of Trump and Trump supporters simply because they belong to ethnic, racial, and religious minorities. If they were Mexican, they listened to the president-elect and his supporters talk about how their parents were criminals and that they should be deported. If they were Muslim, they heard threats that their parents would have to register, possibly go to internment camps, as our country did with the Japanese during one of our most shameful chapters. If they were Jewish, they saw an increase in swastikas on public property, telling them to go home when the United States is the only home they have ever known. And if they were African American, they read about a Trump supporter calling a woman with the same skin color as their mother a quote unquote, ape in heels. That would be our beautiful and poised first lady of the United States. If they were disabled, they saw the president elect mocking a disabled New York Times reporter on national television. Dr. Dance did not say that white students don't need empathy. He was suggesting that vulnerable students need an extra eye. Indeed, when I was speaking at a STEM fair last weekend at one of the, the county's most diverse schools, a teacher told me that his minority students are terrified because, in their words, quote unquote, a bully won. These were third graders. If we had more empathy for minorities, we would not have just had the 70th, 78th anniversary of Kristallnacht. We would not have had a trail of tears. We would not have had Jim Crow. Little girls would not have been burned to death in a Birmingham church. Dr. Dance understands how it feels to walk in these students' shoes. He exercised his free speech to stand up for these students. I'm proud to send my children to a school where the top leader le leads through an end lens of equity. My question to those who oppose him is, why aren't you? <laughs> Our next speaker is Shuli Lid. Good evening. Good evening, Hello. dear BOE members. My name is Shuli Xia. I'm a member of Chinese American Parents Association of Baltimore County. Members from this organization have been making comments about Nula New Year. However, seeking a day off at school is indeed not our ultimate goal. In fact, what we want is a more diverse and inclusive public school system when it comes to recognize culture and holidays from different ethnic groups, including those with a small percentage of population, those who never spoken at the BOE meeting. Therefore, we propose that the BOE members to slightly modify the 2017 school calendar choice B by choosing a day as International Day and closing school on that day instead of closing school for only one specific holiday. This way, everybody can celebrate the diversity of our society. In the meantime, important holidays from different cultures should be recognized in school calendar. Now it is actually a good time to do so. We all know that after this year's election, our country is divided and half of the population is traumatized. Now, so more than ever, we need to do our best to make sure an inclusive and diverse society is a value of our country. Only by standing and uh, staying together, we will not be divided. No matter how different people's opinion are, there is one thing in common. We all want to leave behind a better world for our kids. We all want them to grow up in an inclusive and equal society. 
Of course, inclusive and equality are not just words. They are art of action. Instead of close, closing school for some students and causing confusion in other students, Baltimore County Public School can be the first to show the nation how we can be strong by being inclusive, how we can celebrate multicultural and welcome diversity. By closing school, uh, designated as International Day and not a day for specific holiday, BOE can also encourage students from different groups to share the heritage of their culture, to tell glorious stories of their ancestors, and to help students to understand each other's tradition. All this will indeed help to build a diverse and inclus inclusive com uh, community and to plant the seeds of love in our kids' little mind. I understand that BOE members don't want to go back when choosing calendar B. I would suggest why not go a step forward to create an international day and include everybody in the community. Why not set up a good example for our kids and for the country that we can be creative and strong when facing challenge? Why not be the first one in the state or the country to create an international day in public school? Ultimately, no one can divide us, only we can. The decision is in your hand. Thank you and have a nice evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Timothy Dodge. Good evening. I want to thank you all for your service. Um, this is my son Bjorn's first year in kindergarten, um, and he loves it. Uh, this is the first time I've been to a board meeting, and I hope it's the last. <laughs> but I had to come and speak because of the kerfluffle about the inclusiveness of Mr. Dr. Dance's tweet, or retweet. Um, there are portions of the community that are more vulnerable than others. Um, and I think it demonstrated great compassion for Dr. Dance to comment on that. Um, it's really unfortunate that he had to go back and say that he's in, you know, inclusive for all students. Um, that didn't need to happen. He commented on the portion of the population of the school that, uh, <coughs> that is more vulnerable. Um, and he asked for compassion. And I think that to make an attempt to turn that into something that it was obviously not is short-sighted and destructive and not what you're here for. Um, I don't really have anything else to say for that. And I would really like you as a group to keep working forward and keep making Baltimore County Public School System a place that I'm really happy that my son enjoys and that he still wants to keep going to and that I don't have to come back here and make these kind of comments again. I will. <laughs> if you make me. So thank you again very much for your service and for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Miller. Hey guys. Good evening. I uh, was not anticipating having to go after everyone there. That was some pretty powerful speech, but I will keep it short. Um, good evening. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I came here tonight in support of Dr. Dance. I came here tonight in support of anyone that's scared. Um, I am a volunteer EMT in Baltimore County. I go after work until 1 a.m., 2 a.m., helping people that are scared in their worst times in our community. And what I've seen, Dr. Dance was just trying to make sure that the educators are doing the same thing that I'm doing while they're in school. Um, you know, I, I, I think the real question that I keep asking myself is, do we really in this day and age want to get rid of a superintendent that is that engaged with his students? We have a 15-year-old that came and spoke for a superintendent. I don't think I knew who my superintendent was when I was 15. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I really don't have a 
a whole lot more than to say that, you know, if someone's that engaged that his students are coming in support of him, it's not just parents, it's not just PTA members. There are very strong people that are here that all sit behind this man. And I'm sure there's numerous accomplishments that all of you know, parents know. I very much hope that you take this into consideration before making any punitive assessments. Thank you very much for your time. You. Our next speaker is Aaron Witt Hilker. Good evening. Good evening. Um, as a Baltimore County parent, I would like to speak in support of Dr. Dance. Um, I would also like to commend the board thus far for retaining such a caring and forward-thinking superintendent. Predicting discomfort and preparing support for his students through something as minor as a late-night retweet shows a constant consideration for his students that should reflect well on Dr. Dance, not endanger his position. Additionally, I think there's been some confusion about what diversity is, some idea that it subtracts from any of us to include all of us. Rather, diversity represents and benefits all students. Reaching out to disadvantaged groups is therefore a crucial step, not only in building equality in education, but also in preparing all of our students for the world in which we live. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kathy Forbes. Good evening, thanks for this opportunity to address the board tonight. My name is Kathy Forbes and I'm a 16 year BP BCPS parent and I've spent the last 10 years advocating to this board and the state and local government on education issues. I wanna express my outrage tonight, but not about Dr. Dance's retweet. My outrage is that our community has spent any time talking about the issue. <laughs> Ms. Miller's call for his dismissal over this tweet is outrageous and ridiculous, and a waste of all of our time. Yes. 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 Lady, ladies and gentlemen, let's let our speakers speak, please. I ask this board to refocus on providing oversight to school policy, budget, and property. Ms. Miller, you've used your energy at first trying to find a way to make the board not renew Dr. Dance's contract. Then when you failed at that, you've continued to look for any conceivable way of having him dismissed. Dr. Dance's administration, while not perfect, has done good work. And yet, you seem to view your role as an obstructionist, even when no obstruction is called for. This greatly undermines your credibility. Your mission is clear to those of us who have been watching the board meetings for many years before you arrived. You took your seat at this table with a political agenda. And I think it's safe to say we've all had enough of politics for now. It's time to put aside agendas and turn our attention back to the reason we're all in this room tonight, for the children. I urge this board to reject the bitter angry calls for Dr. Dance's dismissal and focus its energy on the positive steps that will improve our school system. There is work to be done. Thank you. I see uh, Dr. Farone moving forward. He's our next speaker for the evening. Uh, Dr. Bosch Farone. Good evening to all. Good evening. I would like to apologize to all of you board members. For me, taking 20 years asking for equity and diversity, it's all my fault. <laughs> Actually, since I am Muslim American, let me extend my apology on behalf of all Muslim Americans for really coming here uninvited. And 
extend it a little bit more, apologize for Africans from West Africa who came here by force to the United States. Let me remind you this. When Muslims were in Europe, they treated Jews and Christians equally. Spain, Andalusia was really a real example. The Middle East was that way too. And the science and the math and algebra came from Muslims in the Middle East. Let us not really forget Ibn Sina for the philosophy of medicine and that he allowed all that to transmit to Europe. Let us not forget Al Khawarizmi who started the algebra for which we are using the computers today. So with all that apology behind, <laughs> don't forget that Muslim Americans are the doctors and engineers and business people that take care of all of you and us. We are all us, we are not really we and them. And this is really why I came to this country. Today, somehow, I feel like I'm living in Syria and not in the United States. And I really want to say one thing and one thing only, that people who have seen religion and politics mix with school systems and with governments have seen wars, pain, and suffering. You know, let's us be smart. The school system has no place for religion, has no place for politics. It's really all about all the students, and all has to be all. I ask you as board members to recognize the Muslim holidays equal to the Jewish holidays. I ask you to be clear that you should not really have religion and politics. My proposal to you is to open on all non-Komar holidays and have one day for all ethnicities to be recognized. This way, nobody would be unhappy. It's fair. It's the right thing to do. But if not, Eid must be equal to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fern. <laughs> Our next speaker is Brooks Morales. Good evening. Good evening. I am a Baltimore County parent, and uh, if you had told me a year ago that I would be, I would feel compelled to speak at a Baltimore County board meeting in defense of a tweet calling for educators to ensure that mar marginalized students feel safe, I would have been baffled. Um, honestly, I find a lot of things baffling these days. Um, but this is our new reality where uh, I find myself defending the most basic of values. Um, not only am I a parent, but I am a teacher in Baltimore City. The morning after the election, you could hear a pin drop at my school. Students and staff alike were in shock. Moreover, they were scared. As an educator, my job, first and foremost, is to make my students feel safe. In the absence of safety, nothing else can happen. If it sounds like I'm stating the obvious, that's because I am. But alarmingly, the political climate of our country requires that such statements be made. We have a president-elect who strikes fear in the hearts of many, most notably and most sadly in children. In the days after the election, I have dried the tears of my kindergarten students who are afraid that their families won't be safe. And my response is the same that any of yours would be. You are safe at school. Your families and teachers love you, and it is our job to keep you safe. According to some, I should be fired for that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Linda Penn. In the middle of school. Good evening. Good evening. 
again, this is a tough act to follow. Mm. Um, but I thank you all for being here and allowing us this opportunity. I have four children who have all attended Baltimore County Public Schools uh, for several years. And again, I am speaking only with regard to the uh, retweeting uh, controversy that seems to um, be taking up our time tonight. I truly do not believe that Dr. Dance intended to slight non-minority students or to imply that he did not recognize that non-minorities and even children of Trump's supporters could be experiencing anxiety or fear following this election. I believe Dr. Dance was intending to recognize that Trump and some of his supporters specifically targeted and insulted certain minority groups. Non-minority citizens were one of the few groups toward which Mr. Trump did not direct his insults. I could be offended that Dr. Dance did not include girls in his directive to the teachers. Since females were not a segment of the population that Mr. Trump and his supporters seemed to hold in high regard. But females in this country are the majority. We have the numbers and hopefully the collective power to fight for our rights. The groups mentioned by Dr. Dance do not share that power or those numbers. I commend Dr. Dance for encouraging his staff to be cognizant of the feelings of those minorities following this election, which was unlike any other our country has ever experienced. Often those of us that have not personally experienced being treated differently or less than because of our race, our religion, or our sex cannot accept that others are experiencing those difficulties. Dr. Dance was simply reminding educators to show empathy to those students that were particularly upset or fearful following the election of Mr. Trump, and I cannot fault him for that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Moving through our agenda, our next item is a celebration item where we recognize the service of our board member, Mr. Michael Collins. So for this, I'm going to ask uh, Superintendent Dance and Mr. Gillis to please come forward so we can recognize. <clears throat> I'll first ask for a motion to accept the resolution for Mr. Collins. Second. I'm up All in favor. <laughs> All right. <laughs> This is just right here, right there, right here is the There's a movement. This was representative of uh, a total lack of diversity of thought and an engineered platform. Except those folks that have signed up. Oh, they did. Well, I don't believe that, but I think you believe it. I was one who signed up. Well, how are you? Was it for the something? She likes you. All right. Hello. Good evening again. Before I uh, present this resolution, I just wanted to say a couple words. Um, I'm sure many of you over the years have seen the public Michael Collins in our open meetings, but I just wanted to share a little bit about his personality that you see sometimes in our closed sessions. Um, I found Michael to be a fierce supporter of the underdog. It didn't seem like whatever issue we were talking about, if someone was really challenged or in a stressful situation, we'd always find Michael on the side of the underdog. And even though he 
was a politician. He really worked hard to keep politics out of our decision making. So um, I just wanted to commend him on the direction that he's given the board over the years and for his uh, ability to speak directly. He prides himself on speaking truth to power, but I think he's happy to speak to anybody about anything. <laughs> but uh, we really admire him, and I'm sure this resolution doesn't capture all of our thoughts, but I'm going to read it uh, uh, and present it to him this evening. Uh, whereas Michael J. Collins has served as a member of the Board of Education of Baltimore County with distinction and honor from July 1st, 2011 through December 4th, 2016, and he has provided exemplary service to the students, parents, and staff of Baltimore County Public Schools, and whereas Mr. Collins has worked actively for the achievement of all Baltimore County students with focus on preparing all students to be globally competitive, and whereas he has served on the following Board of Education committees, building in contracts, where he not only served as a member, but as vice chair, the Curriculum Committee, and the Government Relations Committee. And whereas Mr. Collins has dedicated his life to public service, and he's placed the needs of all students as his first priority, and whereas Mr. Collins has committed his time and expertise to the Baltimore County Public Schools community now, therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education of Baltimore County, herewith assembled in regular session on the 22nd day of November in the year 2016, recognizes the outstanding contributions of Michael J. Collins, and be it further resolved that the board does herewith extend its deepest appreciation and gratitude for his dedication, loyalty, and service, and further extends its best wishes for good health, happiness, and continued success in his future endeavors. Michael, sincere congratulations to you. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you, Mayor. And I have no, no doubt whatsoever that he has a few words to say. <laughs> As you all know, I never saw a microphone I didn't like. <laughs> First thing I wanted to tell you, I noticed as Chuck was reading this really, <clears throat> um, whereas overwhelming resolution, I noticed at the bottom there is a PS. It says, and don't let the door hit you in the... <laughs> It really doesn't say that. <laughs> I do have a couple of things I want to say. First of all, I want to thank all of you for your kind remarks. <clears throat> Abby, that was very generous of you. I don't know if, if, um, if um, um, why can't I think of his name right now? Bill Lawrence is still here or not. But, and also Bosch and all the folks who spoke last time and my colleagues on the board who spoke. It's very generous of all of you to say nice things and I really do appreciate it. <clears throat> it's been a great honor to serve on the Board of Education for Baltimore County. When I was asked to do this five and a half years ago by the county executive and the governor, my first reaction to them was, are you nuts? I'm going to be 71 in a month and are you sure you want an old man on the board? Well, when I got here, there were a lot of old men on the board already <laughs> uh, who are also gone by now, except for the oldest of all, David Uhlfelder, uh, who's still here. <laughs> but <laughs> David, David outlasted me, but David and I uh, are the longest serving. David is the longest serving member of the board. Um, I do want to just make a couple of remarks, and I know that I always talk too long, but uh, uh, that's just the way it goes. I really tried hard to do good things. And I also, as Chuck aptly said, I speak what I believe to be truth to power, and I speak it very distinctly, and sometimes very directly. Um, and I just did want to say that if I ever said anything that offended any of you personally, I beg your pardon because I never intend any of my comments to be directed at your person, only at your policy, its wisdom, or in the case of my comments, usually its lack of wisdom. But in any event, I did want to make sure that I said that. I do want to, though, take 
credit, and I'm sorry, not surprised, but sorry that so many of the teachers left because they have to go home and continue to work. But David and I are the two original board members who were here in 2011 when we made the decision, I should say in 2012, made the decision to hire Dr. Dance as our superintendent. And that was a leap of faith, to be sure. He was 30, coming to be superintendent of the 25th largest school system in the United States. We took that leap of faith believing that he had the kind of vision and the kind of personality that was something that would help our system move forward. In no way did we view that as a reflection on our previous superintendent, Dr. Joe Hairston, who is not only a great personal friend of mine, but he was also a great superintendent. But the board decided to move forward with Dr. Dance and to make the generational switch. I'm very proud of that decision that we made back then, David, you and I, and the board <clears throat> at that time. I'm also proud to be part of the 10 members of the board currently, which voted to rehire Dr. Dance, offering him another contract. And I just uh, feel that that's very important to make note of, particularly at this time, given the uh, atmosphere that we're, we are in. I, I also, <clears throat> pardon me, want to, uh, mention a couple of things in addition. And this is a comment to my friends, including Dr. Dance, and all of you good, hardworking staff folks, and all the ones that aren't here but are work outside of the schoolhouse. I've been privileged in my life to be able to be in a position to be in charge of a lot of things in my professional life, at which I've been very blessed. And as a leader, you have to do one of three things every day. You have to lead, you have to follow, or you have to get out of the way. The hardest thing for a leader to understand is when to follow or get out of the way. I am convinced more than ever, seeing the teachers and their signs today, listening to Abby for all these years, having taught for 30 years, that it is time for the central office personnel to get out of the way of the teachers in the schoolhouse, to get out of the way of the principals in the schoolhouse, and to let them get caught up on all of the remarkable innovative, creative changes that we have made. It's really important to grasp the scope and magnitude of what we're trying to do as we pursue deliberate excellence in our school system. And Dr. Dance, every day he's been with us, has pursued that deliberate excellence, even when I didn't agree, <laughs> didn't agree with a particular decision or a particular implementation plan or whatever it might have been. I never once doubted his dedication to pursuing deliberate excellence. But it's time now, folks, who are not in the schoolhouse every day, to become the supporters, the cheerleaders, the assistants to our teachers and our principals and all of the in-school personnel as they consolidate and refine and implement those monumental changes we have made so that as the years progress, more of our students will be highly technologically savvy. More of our students will be code proficient, will be Spanish language proficient, will be truly when they walk across the stage, really college and career ready. But we have to give them all a rest now, let them catch up. I don't mean a rest. I mean, arrest from further good ideas. <laughs> because I was a classroom teacher for 30 years, and while I love all of those who have left the classroom, I'll tell you right now, you're fibbing if you don't say you forget a little bit of what it was like on a day-to-day -day basis. Right, Penelope? You forget what it's like. So 
I'm encouraging you in, in the most firm way I can to continue the pursuit of deliberate excellence, but no more new stuff. Consolidate, refine, maybe eliminate some of the busy work, some of the nonsensical, um, I'll say nonsensical, you all can't say that, but um, some of the nonsensical uh, data collection or whatever it might be. Give the boys and girls a break in the, cool, the schoolhouse. They're great people, they work really, really hard. So I want, <laughs> you're welcome, but I want you really to, to, to understand that. I have two other things to say. And my colleagues aren't heckling me yet. This one is directed to them. I take great pride in speaking truth to power. And I've always done that in my entire life. And I will continue as long as I have breath to do it. But I've been troubled in recent times. And as a board member, I'm a little bit troubled too, while having a passionate respect for the First Amendment and all of the rights that it brings. We still have to be strong as board members to not be shy about speaking, speaking truth to inaccuracy, to speaking truth to judgmental errors, sometimes being a little harsher in my choice of words, speaking truth to stupid or truth to crazy. Again, always respect everyone's right to assembly, to speech, to all of those things guaranteed in our Constitution that make the United States of America the envy of the world. But as leaders of the educational system, we have to be courageous and we have to stand up from time to time and not only speak truth to power, but speak truth to other things as well. And my final remark, so I won't disappoint anybody, is about my beloved Kenwood. <laughs> <clears throat> the defining institution of my life was Kenwood High School. All that I have, all that I ever am, ever became, I owe to Kenwood High School that the important things I did in my life, I should say the most important things I did in my life were not done on the floor of the Senate of Maryland, which was an enormous privilege to be there for 16 years, is not done sitting as an administrative judge on the bench in the Board of Contract Appeals for the last 14 years, or here on this board. The most important thing I did was work in those halls and in those classrooms and on those fields and with those young people. So I am officially now turning over the guardianship of Kenwood to my friend Steve Virch, who is a graduate of Kenwood, class of 1974, to June Eaton, who is the representative of our district, the 7th District, and to my seatmate, Marisol Johnson, who is just a wonderful human being. And I'm giving you three the mantle of guarding Kenwood at all cost. <laughs> Make sure the air conditioning gets done on time. Don't listen to Pete tell us it costs too much. Don't listen to anybody say we can't do this because. It's important. And at Dallas, I want to say, Dr. Dance, I should say, in this formal setting, <laughs> don't get any ideas about taking away our new principal. <laughs> Kenwood has an outstanding young 33-year-old principal, Brian Powell, who has captivated the student population and the community in a few short months. And let me tell you something, that's my community. I represented them in the legislature. They've been wonderful to me. But you don't captivate them in a couple months unless you're one heck of a person. So I want to make sure that he stays there. So as you all are letting the teachers implement all of these new changes and pursue that deliberate excellence and that college and career ready students that will walk across the stage, that you leave him there to share for at least uh, a lot of years. That's all I have. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Great job, Mike. Congratulations. <laughs>
The manual itself is organized into six guiding practices, which helps it, which support grades that are equitable, accurate, timely, and specific. So the what of the manual, again, has to do with those six guiding practices. Those practices include practices that are supportive of student learning. Grades that support learning enable students to have opportunities for practice with new and complex information and feedback regarding their performance. Number two, marking period grades will be based solely on achievement of course or grade level expectations. Three, students will have multiple opportunities to demonstrate proficiency. Evidence illustrates that deeper understanding and greater proficiency should replace prior attempts in learning. Four, grades will be based on a body of evidence aligned to standards. A body of evidence allows students to show what they know in a variety of ways through a variety of assignment types. Number five, a consistent grading scale will be used to score assignments and assessments. And certainly last but not least, accommodations and modifications will be provided for exceptional learners. So prior to this school year, teachers had, schools and teachers had the option of choosing any grading scale. This caused many discrepancies within a school. This year, schools had the option of choosing the 100-point grading scale or the even interval 50-point scale. This year, the report cards have been revised to reflect the philosophy of the policy and the six guiding practices. Specifically, report cards now have a separate area to include information and grades that are reflective of factors critical to student development. Those factors include conduct, effort, work completion, working with adults and peers, attendance, and lateness. In addition, a list of indicators in the areas of conduct, work completion, working with adults, and working with peers is also now included with the report card. Those indicators will allow students and families to understand students' progress along a continuum. <coughs> At this time, I would like to take you through an explanation of why the practices were established in order to fulfill the intent of the policy philosophy. To begin, this short video further explains why the shift in grading was necessary. So I know from working with AVID students uh, over their high school career that different teachers do grade in different ways. Sometimes it's a matter of proportion for different uh, aspects of a grade, classwork, assessment, homework. Sometimes it's the proportionality within one of those sections for what different assignments are worth and, and the way we apply value there. And that can lead to differences and challenges with students uh, thinking about what is a fair grade for really assessing what they know and are able to do. Are we grading the journey or are we grading the student's mastery uh, when they've arrived at the destination? It can go either way. For one class, it's, it can be based off of content. But then for another class, it can also be based off of how my behavior is, how my participation is, and also my content because I could be in math class and my grade could drop to a 50 all because I was talking and disrupting other people from learning and trying to concentrate. However, in other classes, I could still get a 100 even though I was talking. There are definitely teachers who don't necessarily grade on accuracy or what the child is visibly able to do. A lot of it is, if I give you this packet and you completed it, you get 100. Did you learn anything? Probably not. But it works in terms of grading. It gets a grade in the book. And if there's a grade in the book, then I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. But the reality is, is that same student who finished the packet didn't necessarily learn anything, is now moving on to another class and another level of high school and can succeed because they thought they were doing fine with completion, when in reality, it's accuracy and where they are as a student that really matters. I think my grades are accurate and aren't accurate. Hmm. 
because sometimes I like not doing good in math and they give me like an A and that's not really accurate when I'm not when I'm doing something bad. And like in reading, I get an A because I really get it. In standard level classes, there are so many opportunities for extra credit. Um, you can do very basic things like bringing tissue boxes into class or hand sanitizer and then you get a few points extra credit. Whereas it's much more difficult in an AP class to achieve um, or to gain extra credit by such rudimentary means. You have to really work hard to achieve a high grade. My teachers grade on quantity and not quality and sometimes they grade on quality and not quantity. I've been working really hard to ensure that my students' grades accurately reflect their knowledge and skills in English language arts. This has been a journey for me. There was a time where students would lose points from daily participation grades or something if they were late to class or if there was maybe certain misbehaviors. And over time, I thought that that was an unfair practice, that really the grades should reflect their mastery of skills. But there is a balancing act to that as well. I think it's important that students learn that there are deadlines, that the real world has deadlines, and if they don't meet deadlines, that there is a penalty for that. So that's one area where my practice is still evolving to think about how do I not just prepare students to be globally competitive graduates with their content knowledge, but also with their character and with their habits and who they are as people. I think what students are entitled to is feedback on all their assignments. It's not so much about the grade as where it shows a student is in the learning progression. I think if we take the adage grade smarter, not harder for a teacher, I think fewer assignments with richer feedback move students further along. So should it be graded? Well, I think every student is entitled to feedback that is timely, accurate, and specific. So just as we heard in the video, students, teachers, administrators, and parents shared what they felt needed to be done. When we spoke to these stakeholders during focus groups, we realized that there was an overlap in how they felt about grades. So our students, for instance, and from them, we learned that grades should be based on what, they wanted grades to be based on what they know and what they can do and what they can demonstrate. The, they wanted the ability to show what they know in a variety of ways, not just assessments. They wanted opportunities to improve, they wanted more feedback, and they wanted teachers to have consistent expectations. From our teachers and administrators, we learned that they felt the grades needed to be based on what students know and what they can demonstrate. They wanted categories and points to be the same for the same course, but that teachers should have the flexibility to create assignments for their classes. They wanted grading scales to be more consistent, and they thought that achievement grades needed to be separated from behaviors. Additionally, our parents explained their ideas, and they were very similar to other stakeholders as well. The, our parents explained that teachers' grading practices needed to be more consistent that categories and points should be the same for the same course, but that teachers should have the flexibility to create assignments for their classes. Some assessments should be the same for the same <coughs> course. And parents wanted teachers to clearly label assignments in BCPS 1. In addition to, in addition, staff reviewed the latest in research to examine best in field practices and recommendations. Some of the leading voices in that work are Jan Chapuy, Ken O'Connor, Bob Marzano, Kathy Vatterot, and Ron Berger. All have done extensive research in this area, and they emphasize that grades should be based on student learning. As Vetterod explains, in the United States, we not only have a skills gap, jobs that can't be filled due to a lack of skilled labor, but also a learning gap, an unacceptable high school and dro college dropout rate, as well as college students who need remediation. As indicated by the National Remediation Data by Sector, there is data surrounding the number of remedial courses taken by students in higher education. This data illustrates the percent of students taking remedial courses. The point being that students who are truly college and career ready have grades that are, re are reflective of what they've learned, thus decreasing the need to take remedial courses upon entering college. 
This work is being done in many districts around the country. While many districts have engaged in this work, our work groups examine the work of 22 other districts in the United States that have shifted their grading practices. Specifically, the work of school systems similar in size and demographics were examined. Those systems include Anne Arundel County, Montgomery County, and Fairfax County. However, it is important to keep in mind that our policy was designed to meet the unique needs of our school system. Our policy does not look exactly like other policies and other school systems because it was crafted based on the needs of our students. No two policies will look the same because no two systems are exactly the same. Over the course of the last year, many input focus groups were held while the manual was being developed. The, these focus groups provided input that provided information and guidance to drive the focus of several work groups. Leaders of all advisory groups were invited to attend focus groups to gather input on the procedures manual and the six guiding practices. In addition, a meeting was held with members of the Baltimore County Student Council. School representatives were invited to attend. There were over 200 students in attendance. Throughout the process of developing the policy and the rule and the manual, a variety of work groups were formed and they met over time to outline the work. This included a group that worked on the policy, the report card revision, the procedures manual, and the professional learning to address the shift. The work groups were made up of principals, assistant principals, assistant superintendents, and as you will see on the next slide, they included teachers and staff from curriculum instruction as well. Some of these groups continue to meet and work this year. The new governance structures allows their work to be reported out to a larger steering committee. This is a continuation that you can see on your screen here of representatives that participated in various work groups. Again, the what has to do with the policy. It also has to do with the manual itself and the six guiding practices. The why has to do with what we heard from our students and teachers, our administrators and community members in our meetings with them. I now want to talk about the how of the work. A little over two years ago, there were several work groups that were charged with examining the revision of the policies in the 5200 series including factors involved in student evaluation. Due to the overlap in the work, separate work groups were combined into one group dedicated to the work of revising the policy. This work group included a variety of staff, including administrators, teachers, and staff from both the academic and business sides of the organization. Although the policy was adopted in 2015, the professional learning began in the 2014-2015 school year with principals and stat teachers. Since the ad adoption of the policy, a professional learning committee has worked to design and implement the learning. So when it comes to professional learning for the district, we always like to think through the who, the what, the where, the when, the why, and the how. Professional learning uh, with leadership teams began in the spring of 2015. And throughout the 2015-2016 school year, it was designed by a committee made up of principals, assistant principals, teachers, stat teachers, and staff. The focus of the professional learning was on the shift in mindset and the six guiding practices that are outlined in the procedures manual. The professional learning was designed so that both system and school-based leadership teams could engage in work around the shift in mindset and the practices. The intent was to build a core group of leaders, both within the schoolhouse and outside of the school, who could support teacher learning through the 2015-2016 school year and beyond. Throughout that time, audiences engaged in professional development around the six guiding practices. This slide shows the topics that were covered during their professional learning sessions. The policy and its purpose, unit plans, homework and redos, grading that supports student learning, the conduct and learning skills rubric, and grading on a body of evidence. 
During sessions, principals had opportunities to have discussions and to provide input with regard to how those practices would look and what the implications would be in their buildings. In addition, the school-based leadership teams learned how to turnkey the professional learning so that teachers could engage in similar conversations. We have since learned that while this design and learning was sufficient in some cases, it was insufficient in other cases. It's not going forward. While school teams were receiving professional learning, community stakeholder groups participated in focus groups to share their views and opinions on the grading practices. This included advisory groups, teachers, and students. The purpose was to get perspectives from a cross-section of stakeholders, and the overall consensus was that students' grades should be based on learning. That brings us to this point in the school year. Since the beginning of the year, we have received a great deal of feedback. We have heard both the pluses and the deltas regarding the shifts in practice. On the positive side, across our stakeholder groups, we have heard support for having grades that are reflective of student learning. In addition, we have heard that assignments both at home and at school are more meaningful and that they're better aligned to course expectations and standards. And finally, we have heard that when implemented, these new practices better support the research around growth mindset and learning orientations for students. We have also heard what is not working in implementation. This includes not enough grades in the grade book for some students. Grade books that are comprised primarily of tests and quizzes. And some confusion around parameters for multiple opportunities for learning. And that those parameters have sometimes become barriers as opposed to opportunities for students. To that end, the steering committee reconvened in October to review the themes that emerged from all of the feedback we received and to discuss enhancements for the manual that could support implementation. The feedback had indicated that there were lessons learned around the type of support that was needed. As a result, Addendum A was developed, and there are three parts to this addendum. The first is that our teachers will receive greater clarity regarding the types of assignments that should make up a marking period grade. And to that end, our content offices have worked to provide examples of the types of assignments that could be part of the body of evidence with recommended point ranges. Secondly, minor assignments will account for approximately two-thirds of a marking period grade, while major assignments will account for approximately one-third of the marking period grade. Again, this is in an effort to balance the grade book so that a student's grade is not based solely on one assignment type. There is a caveat in that our AP courses will continue to follow the college board approved syllabi. And then finally, our schools are going to develop more consistent parameters around multiple opportunities for learning through teacher uh, collaboration. We had heard from students that there were differences in the when and the what of these multiple opportunities. It is important in working with our schools and our communities around multiple opportunities for learning that we emphasize the role of the learning cycle. Again, in the beginning of a learning cycle, students are acquiring information, knowledge, and skills. They then have an opportunity to practice and wrestle with that information as they work through misconceptions. After practice, students receive feedback that helps them refine their understanding and determine what needs further clarification. After that, our students get to apply what they know, and there is an evaluation that usually occurs in the form of a graded assignment. However, what we know is that learning does not stop after students receive a grade on an assignment. And so it's important that students have multiple opportunities to demonstrate new levels of proficiency or understanding. This addendum was first shared with our principals and then it was subsequently shared with our teachers. In addition, forums were held with our principals and PTA presidents or their representatives um, so that we could garner additional feedback specifically around communication. So the ultimate question is always, well, how are our students doing and how are they performing? So each year we monitor our student data quarter by quarter and year over year. It is important for us to take a look at the end of the first quarter this year as compared to the end of the first quarter last year to see if any adjustments need to be made. 
The, the data we'll show you will be in the aggregate uh, for middle schools and high schools because that's where we receive the bulk of our questions and concerns. And so that's uh, where we're going to focus on the, tonight. This data illustrates the distribution of grades for our middle school students, comparing for first quarter of 2015 to the first quarter of 2016. Between the first quarter last year and the first quarter this year, the proportion of grades shows very little variance. Now, while we know that there may be variances in individual student grades, the data in the aggregate shows very little variance. You can see that data at the high school level looks similar to the data at the middle school level. Proportions are similar with little variance between A's and B's and no variance in the percentage of E's. Finally, we received a lot of feedback regarding our juniors and seniors. And so we teased out this data specifically about our juniors and seniors. And this data that you see here demonstrates that the grade distribution for juniors and seniors is very similar to that of our middle school students and our high school students. As we move forward, we will continue to monitor grades at the interim time and at the end of the second quarter as well. So in addition to monitoring data, we are providing multiple means of support to our teachers and our administrators. I think Mr. Collins said, uh, move out of the way and just uh, support them. So uh, this, this graphic really kind of speaks to that. <laughs> we will continue to provide monthly professional development to our administrators that is continuing. It's a continuation um, from the past two years, and we're going to do the same this year as well. We have already held teacher-to-teacher -teacher forums for our teachers. Teachers know best um, how to implement this work, and so they're sharing best practices with one another and how they're making this, how we're getting closer to consistency with making grades about student learning. Teachers have asked us to maintain the interim distribution process that we've had in years past. There were some technological um, difficulties with rolling out interims to every student the way that was proposed. And so we're listening to our, to our teachers and maintaining that interim um, piece. And I'd like to thank TABCO for their recommendation for that as well. The professional study day uh, dedicated, uh, will be dedicated to grading and reporting. So we have a day coming up in January that will be solely dedicated to professional um, learning for grading and reporting. The monthly professional development for STAT teachers will, cons will continue as well. And uh, every week we send out teacher tips uh, on some of the frequently asked questions that our teachers have raised and just to give them some additional guidance and support. Those teacher tips go out every Friday uh, for our teachers and have, has been uh, pretty well received thus far. As we move forward, the following steps are in place. The steering committee will continue to meet monthly. We will monitor student data. We'll monitor stakeholder feedback, as we have done. We'll continue to do so. We'll align our support to that feedback, just as we have done in, you saw in addendum A. Finally, we will collaborate with the Department of Information Technology to ensure that our technology systems support the changes in our practices as well. In addition to reviewing feedback and identifying critical ongoing support in professional learning, the steering committee will consider important questions regarding implementation in the 2017-2018 school year. As you can see on the screen, the following questions will be discussed by the committee. What, if any, modifications need to be made to report cards, including considerations for exceptional learners? Number two, should we consider all schools using one grading scale? And number three, are there parameters for redos that can be system-wide while not interfering with the teacher's ability to use responsive instruction? As we conclude, we would like to leave you with a video that was shot this time last school year. These were the schools, these were our early adopters, if you will, who were willing to implement the shifts in the practice using those six guiding practices and who gave us feedback on the implementation of those practices. 
And so this uh, video captures their voices at that point in time, this time last year. So after the video, I'll take any questions that you'll have, and we will mm -hmm. I'll take any questions that you have at that time. So let's take a look at the video. So after a lot of thought over the summer, I've done a lot of restructuring of the way I grade and what assignments I'm giving to the students. Uh, and really it's all about trying to get the students to become masters of the content. And I'm trying to create a culture that gets the students to focus on learning the material rather than getting a grade. So instead of grading everything that I collect, um, I'm only grading specific assignments that I find are the most valuable and that will really give me an idea of how well the students are getting the concepts. My teacher's feedback helps me improve my learning by getting notes on my test so I can do better the next time. I want my students to be successful. If they're successful, I'm successful. If they fail, I failed them. So how can we work together to make that process better? We're looking for students to improve academically, and in order to do that, we have to provide them feedback on their progress. Uh, as teachers are working together to look over assessments and making sure that they are measuring the skills that we want them to, uh, we can get our students closer to mastering those objectives and skills. The impact on student learning is huge. Our students are more motivated because their learning is more personalized and the support is more personalized. We don't rely on support at lunch or after school. We rely on that also during class when students can work with other students and be retaught by the teacher. So I would say the motivation has increased for our students and I think the teachers appreciate the fact that we are stopping to pause to make sure students really learn, not just covering a curriculum, but making sure that the students learn what is intended before we move forward. My teacher allows me to redo assignments so that I can learn how to fix my own mistakes and master the content more. I feel like my teacher allows us to redo our assignments because she's trying to help us understand what we're doing in class and say if we get a bad grade on something, it helps us like understand what we learn and what we don't know. The teachers are now backward mapping units with I can statements. So they work out what a kid needs to know in certain trajectory towards mastery of a concept. And the students are also more aware of where they are on that concept line. So you could ask a student, what can you do and what can't you do? And now you're more, it's more often the case that the student will be able to tell you where they are in that learning trajectory, rather than just the teacher. This has increased buy-in. Students are much more interested in what they're learning, and they're not necessarily in the class for a grade, but they're in there to learn something. Our teachers are really enjoying using the unit plans with the I can statements and quickly internalizing their value. They're seeing that it has a purpose for them. It helps them backwards map efficiently. It helps streamline the planning process. And then when in turn they go to use this unit plan to um, craft their actual lessons, they're finding that they're focusing on the quality of assignments that they're implementing. They're asking how does each assignment align directly to content standards? Does it promote mastery? So I would say there's been a huge impact on the culture of our school as teachers were looking at school not as the factory system where kids come in and out of a classroom in one size fits all where we teach the same thing to every child and if they don't learn it we still move on. We're stopping and pausing to make sure students master the information and we're also personalizing the reteaching or the redoing that needs to be done so that we can ensure that every child has what they need. So just, I'd just like to take a second to thank especially those early adopters who gave us information on those six guiding practices and how they were working in their uh, schoolhouses. But I'd also be remiss if I didn't thank the numerous teachers and administrators and parents and community members who have contributed their time and talent and energy uh, to this work. We know that it um, hasn't necessarily been an easy shift, but it has been one that Everyone so far has said that they believe that we needed to move from points to learning. That's not an easy shift to make. So we needed their input in order to, to be able to get closer to consistency in our practices. So I'd like to thank all of those stakeholders who contributed to this work. And with that, um, we'll take any questions that you have at this time. Well, thank you very much, Ms. White, Ms. Byers. I'm sure there are going to be some questions. So um, I don't know, I'll just start with a show of hands of people that have questions or comments. Um, Ms. Miller, you had your hand up first there. Yes, thank you. 
It sounds like um, you've really heard the concerns that I've been hearing, you know, from the community on this and, and are, are addressing that. So I thank you for that. Um, I did get a few questions from stakeholders that I thought, I think you kind of addressed some of them. I might ask you to repeat a little bit. But I think the, um, the main point here is, uh, I had a couple of questions along these lines. How will this policy be explained to college admissions officers? And another along the same line is, what will be done for students whose first quarter grades suffered because of the poor training teachers were given about the new policy, especially juniors and seniors applying to colleges? Thank you for that. So to address your first question, when it comes to uh, college admissions, I think what we've heard from colleges so far is that we, they want students who have mastered the material and who are academically prepared, and so that their grades are truly reflective of student learning. And so what um, the college admissions process hasn't changed in terms of the letters um, of recommendation that students still receive from their college counsel counselors and their coaches and from their teachers. So they take all of those uh, criteria into consideration in addition to their achievement grades. So that process has not changed. Um, as for the first quarter grades, we know that that uh, data that we showed is in the aggregate, and certainly there are exceptions. And so we have said to parents who have called us directly on that, that there is a process for that, that if they're talking to their teachers, their teachers have an opportunity then to um, complete a great variance form if the teacher believes that there was some um, an anomaly uh, that occurred uh, in terms of the grade. So we take those on a case-by-case -case basis. In the aggregate, however, um, there's very little uh, uh, variance. Well, let me uh, ask a couple follow-up, because in the slide sh you showed us on that, the comparison from 2015 to 2016, mm -hmm. Um, I think you said you compared them to, to middle school and high school, no. or was that just the, was that the juniors and seniors last year and we this year? We compared the middle school grades six through eight. We compared all high school students grades nine through twelve, those grades, and then we teased out the grades for juniors and seniors. And you found that to be pretty close. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, not a big Definitely. difference there. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I think the the question about the college admissions officers was really about this beginning period where, you know, we're going through the bumps in implementation, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, we've got kids whose grades are suffering because of that. So this is their one shot, and, and how are, are we going to address that as a system? Again, on a case-by-case, -case, on an individual basis, we can certainly um, speak to that in terms of making sure that that grade is the grade that is reflective of learning. If there was something that happened, uh, um, some other type of misunderstanding, then counselors would do what counselors normally do, and that is to address that directly with the colleges and universities. So your recommendation to parents, then? Go to their teachers if they have, have concerns about with that. With the teachers and with their school administrators as well. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Virch, did, yeah, I thought you had your hand up also. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I just have a few questions here. I just wanted to ask you about um, the comment from the Newtown senior. And it's a comment about tissue boxes and hand sanitizers. Now, what I just wanted to kind of find out is. Uh, is, is this just like, like an urban myth, or were there really like <laughs> schools mm -hmm. in Baltimore County hmm. where yeah. students received extra points for tissue boxes and hand sanitizers? Not an urban myth. Okay, but uh, my question is really there were two questions in there. One, is this an urban myth? Or two, <laughs> were there schools in Baltimore County that were giving points for tissue boxes and hand sanitizers? And you've told me that, that no, there, it, was not a, it was not an urban myth. So my question is, were there schools in our, in our system that were giving out points for tissue boxes and hand sanitizers? Now, the big question now is, tissue boxes and hand sanitizers, was this really even a significant problem in our school system, and it was eroding the quality of the grade? So in terms of the tissue boxes and the hand sanitizers, yes, there were points that were given for that, but not only that. There were points that were given for a variety of things. For, um, so for, for instance, the student behavior handbook and for field trip forms not being turned in. So that would go in as a missing assignment and then would be then calculated into the achievement grade. So again, when parents and, and it got together and said to us, what is that grade actually reflective of? That was a very hard question to answer 
because there were so many points that were given. And again, I think the intention behind that was um, not to harm the student, but I think that there was the, the intention to show effort and to show responsibility and to have the students show that type of responsibility. What our teacher said to us is that have that as a separate part of the report card because all of those things are still important. It's still important for a student to demonstrate effort and responsibility and to do and to bring in those things that are needed and to do those things on time. So that became then a separate section so that students are still held accountable for those kinds of things as well. well what I'm trying to figure out here is if it's such a significant problem, it transcends tissue boxes and sanitizers, it's field trip uh, okay forms that are, that are coming in. This is, a, this is such a significant, large, huge, expansive issue to be addressed. And it's these two graphics from 2015 and then 2016. Let me ask you, was there any role, I mean, was there like a pilot? Did we do a pilot for this? How many schools did we do the pilot in? We had a number of schools who, who took on the policy, um, the components of the practices. And so we had a number of schools who tried out those practices and who gave, out, uh, who gave us feedback on those practices. So we had elementary schools, we had uh, middle schools, and we had high schools as well who then gave us that feedback. So some schools chose to take on all six guiding practices. Some schools chose to do one or maybe two. So in terms of a definitive number, how many did all six? I do not have that number sitting here right now. And I, I don't need, back. and I appreciate but you sharing that But we did have me. a number of schools who tried out the various practices and who gave us feedback. And you were able to benefit from that feedback. Absolutely. So you were able to then craft this policy for this, this most recent marking period so that we were able to shrink this, this really massive, huge, unfair, really just distorting number of points in student grades. What I often say is that we're not where we need to be, but we're not where we used to be, so that we're getting closer to consistency. Again, if we think about the policy language, about grades being equitable and accurate, timely and specific, again, that accuracy piece, we're getting closer to that. So for instance, with the multiple opportunities or the, what's known as the redo policy, maybe we're not where we should be, system-wide. I think blanket-wide, sometimes people want to know, well, what is the redo policy? But we're not quite there yet. So what we've said is that within a school, there needs to be a general consensus of what students can do in terms of their contract between the students and the teachers. And so we're getting closer to that consistency. When we think about the phases of this, again, the professional learning started in 2014, 2015, with just the professional learning changing some of the mindset. 2015, we had the adoption of the policy and the rule itself, and many of those, all of the uh, six guiding practices are in the superintendent's rule. So it was about that kind of professional learning and the communication on this is the policy and the rule. 2016, 2017 is really the first year of implementation where we're getting closer to consistency so that we can make it about student learning. We'll eventually, hopefully, get there where we're um, all on the same page. But right now, we're just trying to get closer to that. With accuracy. the two graphics that show de minimis differences in percents of grade distribution, mm -hmm. what, if any, points have now been removed because the grades are essentially the same. Mm -hmm. So then the unasked question, and I won't be asking it, is all this effort, all this energy directed at this huge, expansive problem mm -hmm. has reflected really no significant measurable grade difference in 112,000 students. I think that what it tells us is that the early indications show that now we have more of a, a better understanding of what that grade entails. So that the, the chart that you saw for this school year shows us that we have early indicators saying that when we focus solely on student learning, that we're not necessarily harming kids. And again, this is just first quarter. We will continue to monitor throughout the school year. But if we're looking at this quarter versus this, quarter, this time last year, 
all of the early indicators suggest that we're closer to getting grades that are based on student learning. And that um, with, with that, if we look at last year, we really don't know what went into those grades. But now we have a better understanding of this is more reflective of student learning. Well, in fact, you do know what into last year's grades. Mm -hmm. It were tissue boxes well, and sanitizers the and the travel Absolutely. forms. Mm -hmm. At the end of each year, board members go on stage for really one of the really, really neat things that board members do, and that's to be part of what's really our, our graduating seniors' big day, and it's their family's big day. And the, one of the board members that's there will go up to the podium, and they will read certain specified language that has its origin in some, I suspect, provision of the annotated code or COMAR. And it's saying that because of the satisfaction of these requirements and their performance, et cetera, I can only speak for myself as a board member. It means a lot to me to know that that diploma that that child will receive, that student, that young person will receive, that that really is indicative of their mastery. And I'm, I'm going to give you a pass because it is just so very, very early. But I don't see how we can draw anything from these first quarter grades. And I don't speak for the board, and I don't hold myself out to be an, an expert in any kind of education grading policy. But it just seems way too early to be able to say, you know, now we really kind of we, we know what we are evaluating. That's, again, that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. But thank you for answering my questions. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Ver and I did want to make a comment. I was thinking while you were talking, though, um, not to speak for the staff, but even though the percentages may not have changed significantly, the student population that makes up those percentages could have changed. There could be students that used to make A's that are in the B's and students that used to make B's are in the A's now. So as you said, um, we have to continue to look at this. I don't think we can conclude that nothing has changed. Maybe more changed than we understand just by looking at the... And maybe there were fewer field trips in the first period. <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, Ms. Johnson, we'll move right around. Okay. So I wanted to add, too, having been on the curriculum committee while this policy was uh, being created and vetted out, that one of the things that I liked about the policy was that it, when, when we talk about tissue boxes and sanitizer, uh, as a parent, I, at the end of each semester, if my kids' grades were kind of on the cusp, I would say, <laughs> all right, go ask your teacher for extra credit. <laughs> and the teacher would generally give the student extra credit. If the child doesn't have a parent that's going to say, go ask your teacher for extra credit, that doesn't make the grades um, le a level playing field right there. Same with, you know, when you look, when one of the things that I've, I've, I've heard from staff is that the, now we call them summative assess assessments, they were different throughout the county. So um, Woodlawn or Patapsco or Lansdowne might be doing something different than Lock Raven, Delaney, Fairford. And the fact that we're trying to uh, unify or, or level out making sure that everybody is doing the same thing for their summative assessment throughout the county really was, a, was an attractor for me for this policy. So I wanted to add that in there because it wasn't just sanitizers and tissue boxes. <laughs> um, but I did have a question. You talked about modifications need are one on the horizon. What, if any, modifications need to be made to report cards, including considerations for exceptional learners? What, why did, why, what, what sparked that? Um, that on the horizon number one there because I, I'm just curious because we did hear at some of the um, area advisories not necessarily the exceptional learners I heard more on the children with learning disabilities were having issues with with this particular policy so if you could elaborate on and so that, and, thank you. and I think you you raise a really good <laughs> Touche. You raise a <laughs> you raise a really good um, point, and it's one that our steering committee will be taking a look at as we venture into school year. Certainly, we want all of our students to meet standards, and we want to make sure that we're being fair to all of our students. Um, many of our students who are exceptional learners um, may have some difficulties or learning disabilities that need to be addressed. The, I think the, the debate goes into then do we modify or do we show a modification on the report card? Do we show that there's any um, difference in learning strategies? Where does that show up? Um, and is that on the report card? And then if so, then how does that factor into a student's uh, college transcript and or um, high school transcript and their application for college as well. So that's one that we still are kind of grappling with. Right now we want to make sure that uh, we're maintaining our practices 
um, for our students with uh, exceptional needs, and that we're um, so that while we're still working on this, we don't want to make we want to make sure that they are held at bay as well. Okay, mm -hmm. and the other question was on bullet or number two. Um, should we consider all schools using one grading scale? Are you meaning the zero to one hundred and the the fifty? Okay, yes, we've gotten that question quite a few times mm -hmm. about um, why not just one. Why? Right. rating scale right. uh, why have the option of two and so the the thought is again our teachers I, I, mr. Collins and I keep quoting mr. Collins because it's a wonderful thing. you've raised <laughs> a, a really good point mm -hmm. last board meeting and that our teachers have always known how to grade and that is absolutely true our teachers have had their own grading scales and they do know how to grade the issue has been the variance in the, the, the how that grading has happened. So back to school night, and many of us have served as, um, who are parents and of, of children in the system, you can go to one classroom and there's this one requirement, you can go next door, and then there's uh, another requirement uh, for another class, not necessarily based on the content, but classwork could have meant 60% in one class or 50% in the next class. So again, what our stakeholders asked for was greater consistency. We're not where we need to be in terms of having that one, but going from the, the various types of grading scales that were out there to a getting closer where we've narrowed the options to two and our schools had those two options to choose from. Next year, we'll need to determine whether or not we move from two to one. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Mr. Collins, we're gonna come right around. <clears throat> For Lita, my dear friend. <laughs> This is a stunning waste of time and effort, and money probably, because the principal of Dumbarton said in the video that well, we don't move on until, until the children have shown their mastery. Well, I'm looking at the grade distribution, and while there is some distinction, we still have kids getting E's, D's, and C's. Well, obviously, they didn't show the mastery. Uh, and you really think that in that classroom that where the one teacher had this way of evaluating her children's mastery and this other teacher had a different way of evaluating his children's mastery, that one way of judging mastery is better than the other? Or, again, people in other places in the educational hierarchy, as well as some in the, on the firing lines, come up with this, with, with, with this, with this um, idea. I mean, you can tinker with this for the next 10 years. It's not gonna make any more sense in 10 years than it does right now. And it probably shouldn't, because teachers will know then, as well as I knew 55 years ago, what my kids knew and which of my kids had mastery of the subject, regardless of whether, like I had a principal one time and tell us we couldn't pass a kid if they missed 10 days of school. We, you know, we went, through the, we went through the homework as a critical component of, of, of uh, grades. We went through uh, all of this percentages, this percentages, that. I'm proud to say that in 30 years, I paid no attention to any of it. And, and um, I never had a parent or a kid who felt that they were graded inappropriately. I mean, the teachers know what the heck's going on. This is just, this is just a, a kabuki dance where a lot of people are justifying their existence in a professional way. And, and I think it's outrageous. I think it's absolutely outrageous. I mean, I think you're, again, I think you're all well-intentioned, but this is never gonna result in anything positive or negative for our system. And it's just, it's just stunning that we're, that we're wasting time doing this. And since we're supposed to ask questions on my very last night, I will ask a question. Isn't that so? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, I think I'm going to respectfully disagree in that um, <laughs> I, I appreciate your comments. However, uh, the remediation data, I think, does speak volumes too. Um, students who are entering college and who are under the um, perception that they are doing quite well and that they have mastered their material because they've had really good grades. Yet when they get to two-year and four-year institutions of learning, 
they are finding themselves in remedial, uh, remedial courses. And their parents are finding themselves in a position where then they're having to pay for additional years of schooling. And then the students and those, those college students are finding themselves in position to make a choice about whether or not they stay in school or they drop out of school. So again, I would respectfully disagree and say that we still have some work to do because if, um, if it were just okay and we maintain the status quo, we're going to see those, uh, those rates. Again, when you look at a third of um, high school students who are going on to college who need remedial courses, I think that that speaks volumes to the work that we need to continue to do. I think that's a really valid point. And you know, what you've charged me with on my last night <laughs> is making sure that I go to the doctor all the time, faithfully, take all my medicine, behave myself, try to avoid accidents so I can live for 10 or 15 years to see all of these exciting things, which is why I said what I said earlier, let's implement the stuff we've already done. I was here in a five and a half year, dynamic years of, of, of great change and innovation. But I'm leaving with a big fat question mark in my mind, and I've got to live for at least six, eight, or 10 more years before I can see if, if, if this is right. I'd love to come back here, hopefully as a still spry older man, <laughs> and, and say to you, Verlita, I was wrong. But, um, and I hope I, I hope I am. I mean, I, I know, as, as I said in my, in my, <laughs> my lengthy remarks, uh, I have a huge respect for all of our folks. Um, I do think sometimes we forget a little bit of what it was like in the classroom, because that's human nature. But leaving that aside, because it doesn't relate here at all. I mean, you're all, you're all stunningly well-intentioned, very bright, and very hardworking. But I just have to um, raise what I think is the realistic and accurate point of view. Others may think it's just the contrarian point of view. It is at least a different point of view. But, but um, you know, when I see kids getting E's, D's, and C's, and I see the principal saying, we don't move on until they have mastered the content, well, so, someone's not, something's not happening, you know? Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, thank you for answering my question. Thank you. All right, thank you. We're gonna keep moving around the board there, and uh, Ms. Bratt, you had a yeah. question. Okay, so I just have um, a brief comment and then two questions. So just as far as comment, I do wanna address something that Mr. Virch and um, Chuck brought up, as far as it ha the data being insignificant. Um, I did look at the data, and when you look at it, there's about a 4% drop in A's, um, which may seem insignificant, but when you think about it, that's approximately 5,000 of our 112,000 students. Um, and as a student representative, that does concern me. Oh, was my math off? Yeah. Yeah, that's not the, yeah. Yeah. Oh. We are only <laughs> looking at a segment of yeah, this. Right. Not everybody gets A's, but that's okay. Well, I'm, I'm looking at a small proportion. There is a proportion that changed, and if you, I know we're not statisticians here, and I'm certainly not qualified to make groundbreaking claims or anything. But um, since I took statistics last year, out of curiosity, I ran what's called a two-proportion z-test, which basically looks to see if there's significance in data. And it's this, the conclusion was basically that there was about a 0% chance of this data occurring without the grading policy. So I just wanted to throw that out there, that this is affecting our students, even if there's only a small change in the data. Um, and then just to ask my questions, the first being, um, so I do know that this is currently a recommendation. Um, is there a point in which schools and teachers and administrators will be held accountable for following the grading policy? I'm glad that you brought that up. This is a no-fault year for our, uh, for our teachers um, because it is the first year of implementation. Mm -hmm. we're, we're going to monitor and see how it goes um, throughout the course of the school year to make sure that the what we see in terms of uh, the grades being consistent, that we want to make sure that that, that is true throughout the school year. Again, um, w what we've heard is that the switch to student learning is the right switch. It's about now the, the, the details of it and how we can move forward. So we have not set a date uh, okay. for a requirement uh, where uh, anyone will be punished or penalized. Uh, we're looking at making sure that we're uh, moving very methodically and deliberately as we're listening to those who are giving us feedback on the implementation. Okay. Um, and so my second or my last question was based um, we were talking about unfair grading systems and the tissues and the turning in completion forms. And I do know that as far as redo 
allowing for redo. Some teachers are doing this thing where you can only redo if you turn in a box of tissues or if you do the ungraded assignments. So I would like to make the argument that perhaps there are still problems or that there are, <laughs> thank you, I can go redo my calculus assignment. Um, I was just wondering if there's any, if there's going to be any checks on punitive redos or redos that don't necessarily benefit the student individually. Yeah, so um, in the sense that I think we have to continue to monitor as schools are developing these consistent parameters, I think we're gonna have to monitor what those look like because the intention was not for it to ever become a barrier, but rather an opportunity for students to demonstrate those higher levels of proficiency. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Gillis, do you have Thanks. As a, uh, as a board member, as a parent, as a local business person, as an employer, I commend you for uh, focus on mastery of uh, the material. It's absolutely essential that the focus of education be on mastery of material, but I think you do a disservice to everyone um, if you don't uh, give substantial weight uh, to the discipline that uh, students need to do things on time, to do it uh, in uh, the order that the teachers expect it to be done, uh, and that uh, allowing whether it's called redos or second chances or additional opportunities, um, I am concerned uh, will um, I will not be focusing focusing on the life skills that uh, students need to learn the discipline to do things when they're due, which is the the world of uh, of after school, uh, the world of business. So uh, it's not really a question, but I think that uh, putting all your weight on mastery and uh, none of your grading weight on uh, doing things on time and doing it one time and uh, giving uh, teachers the uh, burden of perhaps having to um, write second tests because they can't give the same test twice um, or doing all that stuff I think is a burden that uh, really needs to be considered when, when you're doing your final evaluations. Thank you for that, and I think that that is a point um, well taken, and one that we have heard in terms of, and just for clarification, and just so that everyone knows, and I, I believe we may have mentioned this before, but the culminating events in the unit assessments are not a, are not uh, negotiable in terms of students redoing those uh, culminating events and those uh, uh, assignments. Some of the other um, types of culminating and summative assignments are also not si assignments that can be turned in late or it can be redone. So there are uh, absolute assessments and other projects where teachers can draw the line in the sand to say this is when it's due and this is what, uh, th these are the expectations. And so we believe that that's important for a teacher to set that criteria criteria and during the learning process though we've said that it's important for students to have those multiple opportunities and it's not just us saying it so when you look at what's best in research they talk about in k-12 education that it's really important for students to have the benefit of learning for them to have the feed the benefit of their teachers feedback during the learning process and then for them to have a culminating event so that is in terms of k-12 education that is the best um, process what's best in field for students to be able to have that to act on that feedback it's not just enough for them to get the feedback and then not to have to be held accountable for doing anything with it we're saying that there's double accountability actually when a t when a student gets that feedback then they are then required to do something with it and then that further um, uh, there there there's uh, learning experiences as well but there is a line in the sand for for um, teachers to draw as well Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did have a question around communication. Um, going back a couple months, I think uh, <laughs> as the policy was rolling out um, in the curriculum committee, we talked about really going overboard, getting um, or allowing our parents and community to give feed or input into the grading policy. And then after this first quarter, when the grading policy was implemented, we certainly, I got the sense that the parents and community got an understanding that something had changed and and some of that created p panic and and so forth but i guess in my recent interactions with the community um, I'm not getting the sense that they understood even that now there's a change that's been made because, you know, I got the sense, you know, in the questions I was getting, 
um, people were saying, well, I understand homework doesn't count anymore. And I, you know, so I think the general, I'm just talking very, very generalities, the public has a sense that something changed, but they don't seem to have the sense that we've done anything about it. And I just wondered, now that we've made this addendum, how is that communication and information getting out to parents and students? Uh, I guess from Aislinn, we get it, they, they do know, some of them know, but would you say that we're, you know, getting the word out that yeah. we've heard so, with? Again, yeah. so in terms of uh, lessons learned, so when it comes to the professional learning for teachers, we realize that it can't be an either or in terms of uh, creating the, uh, the the teacher teams or the school-based teams, uh, or having those face-to-face -face interactions with teachers. That was a learning for teachers. For parents, the same would be, would be can be said again. So this year um, and this quarter, what we did was we sent a, uh, a message and a letter directly to parents okay, uh, with the report card so that we could okay. have direct communication with every parent. We knew that parents would be looking for the report card, and that is one document that okay. we know that most parents would, uh, would look at, and so we attached the letter to that so that we could have greater communication. In hindsight, that direct communication parent to parent maybe could have been done better, but uh, that was again a lesson learned, so we tried to do better uh, at the end of the first quarter. Uh, thank you. Sure. For your father. Thank you. Um, Let me change the direction a little bit because I think that uh, we're losing sight of the fact of why the change and why we need to have kids graduating school with some degree of intelligence. Uh, fortunately, uh, I've been able to represent and know uh, many businesses, small businesses, uh, that don't need college graduates. And, and yet they too are providing remedial education. Because if you talk to the businesses in this area, you'll find one of the things they'll say is, is kids coming out of school don't know anything. They're not smart enough to work here. Mm. And our workforce is changing dramatically. And at every level, uh, I was at a meeting not too long ago where one of the larger uh, firms in town that does welding, they can't find enough welders. Now, now why, why can't kids who come out of school uh, can't uh, learn to weld uh, and they pay decent wages? What's happening to it? And therefore, these, these uh, businesses, uh, the owners will tell you, well, we have to teach the kids what to do. Um, I think we also have to pay some emphasis on the, on the efforts of, of our uh, workforce and that this grading policy not only uh, pertains to those who are going to two and four year colleges, but those who are going directly, even into the military, we hear some of the same things. I think it's really important that whatever we do, we do in that direction. And if this policy has to be tweaked over the next couple of years, well, so be it, but at least let's accomplish something and provide our workforce with intelligent kids graduating our schools. Thank you. Ms. Kazi. Kids of yes. Kids of here, the ones you talk Thank you. Um, I have a couple comments and then I have a couple questions, but I do have a suggestion first. And this uh, I was thinking about after um, Mr. Gillis asked um, questions in the curriculum committee, which I was um, very happy to attend and that was very helpful and the discussion there was very rich. Um, and one of the things that he was saying is that the redo really does not sound as if it's a, a term that should be in education. And uh, so I was going over my notes, listening um, to uh, Dr. Mc reading the notes from when Dr. McComas was talking about the redo and um, talking about a reinvestment of the teacher and the student in terms of understanding what was missed based on the feedback and then another opportunity. So I would make a suggestion that it's a completion opportunity, co-op for short, the teacher and the student working together to fill in the gap to fill in the blank, to do the drilling necessary for the math skills or whatever it is. Because it is important, as colleagues have pointed out in your presentation, that the students, when they get a grade, that it is accurate. Um, so that's a suggestion that I'll make. Um, the other thing, I just want to make some um, general comments. One, I would like if, um, Ms. White, you could please email to the board the letter that went out with the report cards. We received a letter from uh, Ms. Baton, and apparently there was some concern about that letter. Um, still maybe blaming the teachers, my words, not hers. Um, and and I, on that point, I'd like to say two things. I think it's not fair to say 
how much work was driven by the focus groups. When we just heard from Ms. Baton of TABCO that the focus groups were insufficient, when we just heard from Mr. Case that um, he is glad that he's now being reinvited to the focus group efforts, uh, when I understand that the student member of the board um, attended one meeting. So, and even if uh, there were other meetings that were intended, that's one student out of 112,000 students. And one thing that I, uh, that was not mentioned and which there has been a lot of feedback around is um, where were the parents? Where were the parents in the focus group? Where were the parents um, in all of these issues? Um, and right now when you say you're still taking feedback, there's a little box on the website where they write something in and they get no reply. The board has not seen all of that input. We see a culmination that you call frequently asked questions, but that still doesn't tell us what is the parent feedback. Do 95% hate it as it seemed back before the report cards came out? Do they all love it now? I mean, we really need some information because if we don't, if we don't convince the parents whose child is the customer, those parents and the children are the customers of the service that we provide to them, that we are legally obligated to provide for them. And if we as a board don't know that they're actually convinced that they are learning and that their grades are specific and equitable and timely, then we're not doing our job. Um, and I would say that there is a benefit to improving the grading process because what happens with technology is technology can bring clarity and detail to a lot of people very quickly. So maybe back when you were grading um, just a few years ago, Mr. Collins, um, no one really knew what anyone else was doing. But when we're all on Edline or now N grade or these other grading things, and you can see where those numbers are coming from. And so it's easier for us as a system to look at that and say, is there consistency among our teachers? Because I go online and look at it and I say, why does that teacher only have three grades in? This one over here has nine. And guess what? The ones that have more grades seem to have a better grade. I don't know why that is. If you're required to do consistent work, do you just get in the groove of doing consistent work and then there's that uh, constant memory going? Um, so I would say it is important to look at the grading, but do it with real input from the real people that really matter. The parents, the students certainly at the high school level, the teachers, please, please, please increase the number of teachers involved in this process. And also the administrators, so we're not gonna leave uh, um, Bill Lawrence and Case sitting at the table without an answer. Um, the, one of the concerns that I've heard, and I don't, um, I'm gonna put it out here, I'm not expecting an answer, um, but if you have an answer, that's great. The curriculum needs to be in place for mastery learning, I think we can agree. Um, but what I've heard is that teachers have said it's not there, and part of the work that they're doing is writing curriculum. So I think that I would like some questions asked around that and some feedback around that in, in and I don't know if that can come up in the next curriculum committee meeting, which I'm happy um, to attend. Um, and the other thing about the national remediation data, um, there is an issue, and Mr. Ufelder pointed it out for businesses, and it's also an issue for the, for the universities, that the students need to be prepared. Um, but there's also some skewing in those numbers because they also include students who have been out of school for several years. So especially when you're talking about the community colleges, when there's adults coming back, taking an opportunity for advanced education, and their skills rightfully may be a little rusty and they'll need to take remediation. So what would be helpful is to have the numbers specifically only for high school students. Um, and then we've heard about the technology problem to the rollout. Um, I would like to see a little more specifically what that was that was affecting the teachers with technology. Was it the end grade? Is it some other software that's new and out there? I would like to um, understand what that is um, and then what is being done for this second quarter. Um, the other thing when I was in the curriculum committee and we looked at the, um, we looked at the comparison data 
and here's the one for 11 and 12. Um, there are differences, and, and Aislinn, I think that's wonderful that you used your t statistics and figured out that it's not insignificant difference. And I can tell you, for any child that moved down in their junior or senior year from an A to a B or a B to a C or a C to a D, that is significant. Um, and then I became a little more concerned after the meeting when I was speaking with you, and I said, which schools are using which scale? 100 to 0, 100 to 50. And where is that data? Because that data should be split out because that is what will tell us which scale is working or which scale is creating the most difference between last year's grades and this year's grades so that we can analyze that. And if we don't know which schools are using which scale, I see that as a real big implementation problem. So I would like to have that information. Chuck, is that, excuse me, Mr. McDaniels, is that a piece of information that they can compile and it's give available. to us? I would think that they would share it, yes. It, it is available if they create us a new pie chart. So I'll just take a minute to, uh, to speak to some of these um, questions, concerns, and, and certainly we can, we have a standing uh, item um, on the curriculum committee agenda and certainly uh, can, and can update the curriculum committee should Ms. Johnson uh, deem it appropriate. So with that, um, we'll, we, we'll be happy to bring some of that information back. In terms, and I will let those who uh, dwell in statistics really kind of um, speak to this, uh, who can speak to it better than I can. But from my understanding, and again, we did raise these questions to make sure that we are looking at um, real data and not um, data that is skewed in any way. We wanted to make sure that we had a, gr a better understanding of whether or not there was an actual variant. So if you, it's my understanding that if you take a look at uh, the, the variance in the grade distribution, should there have been uh, a major discrepancy, it would have shown up in the aggregate uh, data if there had been a major discrepancy uh, in the data. So again, um, they can speak to statistical significance. And then when we look at um, students um, with the 100-point scale versus the 50-point scale, you're not just talking about clear and clean um, students who did one or the other. Remember that our teachers still have ultimate autonomy over their grading practices and their grading scales. So although a school may have adopted a 100-point scale, there are teachers who said that they wanted to maybe try the 50-point scale or that they were interested in the 50-point scale. So it may not have been necessarily pure in any given school. So again, trying to capture that data if you want it to be completely accurate, we want to make sure that we have uh, schools that clearly, solely, where every teacher then participated. And we can certainly um, follow up uh, with curriculum committee on that. And I'm not sure if Dr. Brown wants Definitely. to elaborate on He was uh, ready to burst out of his chair. <laughs> well, just a uh, brief comment. Um, I certainly uh, admire the uh, application of, of, of what you've learned in school. One of the things that you would have also uh, encountered in that class, though, is a, a great caution. In, in statistics, and that is not to infer causation from correlation. It, it's a mantra that, that we put in place. And in fact, I think if we look back over time at our grades and the variation in our grades, there has been gr greater variation from year to year than what we saw this year. And so I would be very reluctant to attribute a causal uh, inference uh, tied to that analysis. The other thing, and just technical on statistics, um, what we have are population numbers. We have all the numbers for the kids. We have all the grades. And so the differences that exist are the differences that exist. Inferential statistics are used when you make a sample. You want to make an inference about the population as a whole. When you have the population as a whole, you have the numbers. You don't have to make that inference. You don't have to make a guess with that. The population numbers are what they are. And to Verlita's point, um, had there been substantial bias due to multiple scales, it would have shown up in the aggregate numbers for the system as a whole. They would have been pulled. I would like to say that I don't agree with that because if you have, excuse me, if you have a <coughs> 0 to 100 scale, and let's say that that kept grades um, on, the, on the maybe lower end of the scale, okay? And then you have the 50 to 100 scale, which is any low score that was below 50 turns into 50. So maybe those schools had dramatically 
better grades. So under this mastery grading procedures that we had on the first quarter, if you had schools on some schools, some classrooms, zero to 100, and you had some schools, some classrooms on 50 to 100, the 50 to 100 could have um, added a lot more positive grades and the zero to 100 could have had a lot more negative grades. And when you put them all together, it can look insignificant. So what you're actually saying, in my opinion, is that we really don't know what this means. We really don't know what this means. And all I would like to do is to suggest that you have the ability to pull the teachers and the schools and to go back to all the data that's right there, like you said you have it, and do a little refinement of the process so that we can understand more clearly really what is happening to our students under this. And, 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 and to be clear, I believe students should be graded on the mastery of their content as one of the key factors. So I'm not arguing about the philosophy. I'm arguing about the reality of the implementation and whether we can tell Senator Collins in four or five years that this actually worked. I would like to not wait that long. I would like to know a little bit more about what just happened because I can tell you as a parent who just got two students into college, every A counts, every B counts, every C counts. Um, so I would just suggest that we take that a little more seriously. And uh, is there anyone else on the board that feels that way, that this information is available and valid and would like to have that? Um, you know, you know my skepticism. I've, I've said it already several times, but if we can, the more we can know, the better idea we can get. And maybe I'll just have to wait four years. Well, and it will inform how we move forward in in the most <coughs> positive way. And then, last, my last question was: uh, I also heard from some teachers that there's now a four-point scale being piloted in some schools. Yes, there are two elementary schools, one middle school and one high school. So when we're talking about the horizon, the horizon may include another change of a grading scale? Not necessarily. We're just at this point um, working through this with those four schools. So no decisions have been made around that. And those four schools opted they in, opted in. Uh, to that process? They volunteered. Do the parents at the school know about the... Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have four schools, mm -hmm. so you can keep track of that data, and that's something that you could present Correct. later yes. to the board when you have more information. Okay. I think that's it. Okay. Ms. Williams. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. McDaniels. Uh, Ms. White, I just want to first thank you and your staff for the very clear um, hard work and effort that you have put in to trying to clarify the policy um, and um, make the manual more functional um, and in the best interest of our, our kids. I do want to say that I concur with my colleague uh, Kathleen Quasi's suggestion of uh, deletion of the redo language uh, with regard to the policy and manual and focus more on the concept of project and or grade completion. <clears throat> I think that sends a much more positive message to our students. Um, I also, um, I'm actually concerned as to whether or not every school will be really enforcing the policy across the board for every student. Because actually, I mean, I can see a situation where, um, you know, favoritism or, you know, extra projects can still slip into this process. And I, I guess I'd like to know what safeguards are in place to really assess this. Because as um, Ms. Johnson said, every parent, every child rather, may not have a parent that says, ask what extra credit. Um, and even if that parent does, every teacher may or may not um, provide that incentive. I, your, your point is well taken, and again, that's why we're um, trying to move very methodically in this so that we can get closer to consistency. We're not where we need to be uh, with it yet. And again, um, I know that that's problematic. 
uh, for um, many of our students who may not be able to have the benefit of a consistent um, grading policy. But I believe that also that it's important for us to su support our, our staff and our administrators. Our teachers are working very, very hard. Uh, we need to do um, what we can to support them through the process and to do a better job of uh, communicating as well. So until we get through this kind of learning curve, then I don't see where we're going to be necessarily 100% consistent. But every day, every uh, quarter, we're moving closer uh, to that in that direction. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Heaton, did you have anything? All my questions have been asked and answered. Okay, Mr. Stewart, uh, anything? Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. It's just really about process. Um, you noted that you had help from teachers in the implementation stage, but I was interested in whether you think in retrospect that you had enough teacher involvement in development and fleshing out of the policy before it really got into the implementation stage and whether there are lessons learned there. That's a fair question. I think that um, in, in hindsight, we would have gotten more face-to-face -face time uh, with our teachers directly. So again, uh, we've had um, a, a lot of uh, teacher kind of representatives, and mm -hmm. um, but certainly when we're talking about 9,000 teachers, um, it would have been um, nice if we could have gotten more face time uh, with more of our teachers. So in hindsight, I think we would have done that. Do you think it's a fair point, I think, which Ms. Payton raised regarding the devil being in the details and the assistance necessary to make this policy effective maybe was also in the drafting of the policy itself as opposed to just editing or input to what a document may look like? So there are two things. So again, the policy and the rule, um, we did get um, teacher input for that. Again, we had a separate committee <coughs> for the policy and rule. The policy went into implementation in 2015. At that time, our principals, our stat teachers, and just the system overall realized that those six guiding principles are all listed in the rule. So there was system-wide communication in terms of what was in the rule itself. When it comes, though, to the manual, you know, the teachers, uh, we did not think to have teachers actually write or craft or type or edit uh, the manual. Uh, we, we have learned then, since then, that that's what they desired to do. We, we didn't want to burden them with the actual I understand. typing it, of the manual. Do you think that there's a practical way to have done that or to do that? with changes going forward? I think that when it, it, it's similar to writing curriculum, for instance, we do involve writing curriculum. Um, certainly when it comes to actual dr the drafting of that, we do have a number of central office personnel who will do the actual drafting of, of that. Um, now that we can hear that that is their desire to be able to have that level of input, we will certainly move forward in that direction okay. in the future. I think you mentioned with Ms. Johnson that there are concerns that are going to be, uh, or at least changes coming to this policy and to the manual itself going forward, and it sounds like some of them are going to be substantive. Is that, is that right? Well, it depends. It depends on the, the, the data that's analyzed, and it depends on the, the result of what the steering committee um, decides in terms of moving forward. Um, I think we heard about the, the rate of change and how much is too much, and all of that will need to be um, taken into consideration as we move forward. Um, if we move forward, we, we may decide at the end of this school year to keep everything the same over the next school year, but again, that's, that is for, up for consideration by the steering committee. Okay. Well, I appreciate the support that you're giving to teachers now, but I would strongly encourage you that to the extent that there are going to be substantive revisions going forward, that they might have an even greater role to play in the development of that piece. Well taken. Thank Thanks. you. Yes, uh, Ms. Jones. I apologize. Um, so as I was listening to the four-point scale, is there any way that we can, without pulling the entire grading and reporting policy um, and manual back, pick maybe four or five schools throughout the county to um, monitor the 50-point scale and the 100-point scale, and maybe even use those schools that were already in the process in the 14-15 school year that have already have, have the buy-in, and use those kind of as your as your smaller design. pilot, um, because we're not piloting it now, We've, it's, like it's pushed out everywhere, so why not use this, the sample group and people that have already you know, got the buy-in, and then it'll give us the data that we need to really see if this is, is, is working throughout the county. Thank you, we can take a look at that research design. Absolutely. Thank you. 
Mm. Well, again, thanks to both of you for your time and your openness. Um, when is our next curriculum meeting, uh, Ms. Johnson, do you? It's, I do not but know um, right now. I think for follow-up, we want to, certainly there were some, a lot of questions raised. We'll try to get as many of them to the curriculum committee and then back to the full board so we don't uh, to lose that um, information. Um, did you have a sure. comment too? If, yes. If, if possible, Mr. Chair, members of the board, if I can have sort of some final, final uh, comments on this one. Um, first of all, I want to begin by just saying that uh, I think Ms. Baden and I uh, have come to both agree that um, the, the why is extremely important of what we are trying to do here. So we all agree on the why. I think we can Monday morning quarterback on the how, and I probably do that more than anyone in this room in terms of if we could go back um, even two years when we were working with the board around policy development, ultimately the manual. Um, but I want to first and foremost say a special thank you to our teachers. Um, this is a season of Thanksgiving, and so our teachers, I think Mr. Collins is exactly right. Uh, I personally have put a lot on our teachers. Um, I, coming into an organization, doing my listening and learning, I think we all recognize that we want it to go from being a good school system to well on a journey to being a great school system. And the commitment is there to get us there. But our teachers do bear the brunt of that work. So I do thank them, Abby. I do. I tell you that a lot. Um, but but, but I, I don't say that just as a, as a talking point. I truly do mean that. And so I said it last meeting. I'll say it again. I do regret not giving the full professional development I think all teachers need it on a personalized basis and we talk about that a lot for students but all of our teachers need it on a personalized level even common vocabulary that some teachers may get that other teachers may not get and we are committed to getting this right I, I had my teacher advisory council meeting last week which we all talked about grading and there was some very substantive discussion that came from that Abby that I'll be sharing with you Miss Baden that I'll be sharing with you but the next day we had our student advisory meeting and I'm gonna tell you they brought up several stories Jordan was there Aislinn was there as well and they gave us some very significant suggestions that we need to make sure we implement as well too um, so what I did share with both groups is let's not be uh, fooled into thinking that we're not gonna be going back over the next three to five years revising this Fairfax County Montgomery County Prince George's County any county has done this they took it five years to go back and make sure they got it right and they constantly reviewed it and I think that's where we need the board's governance around this, the board's guidance around this to make sure that we continue to get this right. But I do agree with Verlita, Ms. White, and, and um, I asked Ms. Baden to add, give us some more teacher names to make sure that we add those individuals to the steering committee as well to add additional teacher uh, voices there. Uh, but I do want to say a special thank you to our teachers and to our students who gave us some really good feedback on it. Um, but I am probably biased because I do say that we have probably the hardest working chief academic officer um, in the country who bears a lot of the brunt of what I um, share with her and ask to be done. Um, but thank you so much, uh, Verlita, to you and your staff for what you're doing. You're listening to comments. We listen to comments from our community, our parents, our teachers, our administrators, and we are making the adjustments. Um, at the end of the day, we do want to make sure that we can guarantee to our students what they get is what they earn and it's what they know. Um, because I will tell you, I do talk to many, many students who they leave us and they've graduated in valedictorian, salutatorian, and they're struggling. And when a lot of folks, what they don't tell you is that those classes they take, because they're taking classes in college, they're not counting toward any type of degree. And parents are unfortunately having to, take, to pay for that. So we want to make sure we do every single thing on our end that we guarantee kids that the grade we give you is the grade you earn based on the material that you in fact know. So thank you so much to... Uh, um, all of our, our folks, but most importantly, though, in this season of Thanksgiving, thank you to our teachers. We really do appreciate you. I know I do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dance. And thank you again for your time. All right, uh, moving right along, our next item is uh, contract awards, and I'll turn that over to Mr. Gillis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In anticipation of tonight's uh, board meeting, the Building and Contracts Committee met and discussed uh, four contracts uh, and heard from both Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixit about them. And I'm pleased to recommend uh, to this board uh, for approval contracts K-1 through K-4. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion then to approve items K-1 through K-4? It's been moved. It's been moved. Uh, any discussion at this time? Ms. Quasi. Um, can we just separate out um, item 
uh, contract number two, the paint interior exterior. And um, if we could just do that, and then I just have comments on, on the air conditioning before we vote. All right, we'll pull out items K, item K2. Um, then uh, Move to items item three and four. Thank you. Uh, any discussions on one, three, and four? If not, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Cossie. I just wanted to make a statement that uh, item four is the installation of air conditioning at Pot Spring Elementary. And I just want to commend that community who has come before the board many a time to, um, to request the uh, air conditioning for their community. And I am going to be voting for this because of my belief that health and safety concerns for students and staff are of the utmost importance. Although I'm not convinced that our overall plan for air conditioning the schools um, over the next few years is the best and most cost effective use of taxpayer dollars, nor the most timely way to cool all the schools and also plan to alleviate overcrowding, issues with clean water, and obsolete and inefficient facilities. But this is the only way that the county executive will allow it to be done. And this board does not want to fulfill its responsibility to ask for an evaluation if this is the best plan. So I will vote to support the Pot Spring community in getting the air conditioning that it has advocated for for so many years. And I want to thank especially the PTA of that community and others that have helped to get it to this point. <coughs> Mr. Birch. I note that one of the contracts is a half a million dollars to ask Sherwin-Williams. Um, I, I was uh, at... Um, Mr. Birch, we aren't... That, oh, no. Oh. I assume we're going to do both of those together. If not, I'll just wait on the because she asked for the painting to be broken out as well. Yeah. Well, we're, 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 we're one doing one, three, and four. We'll come back to that one. Thank you. <laughs> any, uh, any other discussion on one, three, and four? If not, uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. All right, now we're discussing item two. Do I have a, a motion to approve item K2? to uh, delay the contract. Okay, it's been moved and second to delay item K2. Any discussion about that? Mr. Birch can go first if he wants. Well, well I wanted to find out so if we can get some of that half a million dollars worth of Sherwin-Williams paints uh, over to um, um, our Pleasant Plains Elementary School that needs some painting done. I can tell you I was at Oakley last week and there were painters painting there. And they were doing a darn good job. And of course, I have talked with the central office, and uh, there may be some offing in the, uh, in the summer about getting some paint over to Golden Ring Middle School. Uh, there's a need for painting done over there. So if this is going to be where the paint's coming from, I'm going to support a half million dollars for Sherwin-Williams for paints for our school system. Right. So uh, if there's no other discussion on the motion to delay, all in favor um, of the I just had a comment about why I asked to delay it. Um, there were 13 bids requested, only two were received, and only one was found responsive. And in the uh, Building and Contracts Committee meeting, Mr. Sarah said they may consider uh, sending it back out to bid, so I just wanted to ask them to take that opportunity to do it. All so right. if, it's, if Mr. Sarah indicates that this is going to be um, too long of a delay for projects that are in process, if you could clarify that. Well, my recommendation would be, if possible, um, to allow this to go forward so that we don't run into a situation where we don't have a supplier. I'm not well versed on the amount of inventory we have in paint at this time. And uh, we did identify at least one other um, potential bidder that we've used in the past. Um, so um, I'd rather not leave the maintenance folks completely in the lurch, but I will, um, uh, we've talked with the maintenance folks about um, seeing the kind of pricing that they get and uh, we've used Sherwin-Williams paint before, among several others. Um, and if they're seeing that they're really not uh, getting their needs competitively met, uh, we'll definitely, I'm not entirely happy that we can't get, we can't always get a variety of bidders, but 
you know, PP&G is a major corporation and why they were put together such a um, incomplete proposal astounds me, but um, nonetheless, uh, uh, I would certainly make a commitment to do that, uh, you know, in, in good order over the next few months if, if that's acceptable. Um, given that new information, Mr. Chair, is it appropriate if I can withdraw my motion to delay? And second it. Well, yeah, we have to vote on it, I believe. Okay, then okay. I, I would ask well, people to vote against my motion. <laughs> well, we've set you. Her second. Yeah. Well, let's just vote, yeah. Or do you want to withdraw your, okay. We'll okay. withdraw the motion. Yeah. George, I have a question. Who do we have our existing contract with? Well, um, the existing contract, uh, which expires December this at year. the end of the month, right. uh, we the three vendors that we have are Budeckis, McCormick, and Sherwin Williams. Is there any opportunity to extend the current contract for another 90 days? Um, I believe oh, that um, we would need to make sure that the vendors are, are willing to do so, in which case we could bring it right back at the next meeting, uh, if, if you'd prefer that, that. That may be a good alternative. Uh, yeah. If we can extend the existing contract until you can further research. Uh, and this is a five-year contract, so yes. perhaps well, you're I, right. We I, would urge, <clears throat> I would urge the board to, um, since the, the motion to delay has been withdrawn. I would urge the board to vote in favor of this contract. These contracts are terminable at will, uh, and if it if it is determined that there's a better contract to be had out there, they can have one. But I think that we need to have a constant supply of supplies, and that's what this contract does. All right. There's no further discussion. The original motion was was um, presented. All in favor of approving K two, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Then the motion carries. I think we've covered all four. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next item is uh, new business, and uh, that will be a report on policies, a first reading. And for that, I'll turn to Ms. Williams, the chair of our policy review committee. Thank you, Chairman McDaniels. Good evening, everyone. Uh, to Chairman McDaniels, Superintendent Dance, and members of the board, the Board of Education's Policy Review Committee has reviewed the policies presented to you for first reader on tonight's board agenda as Exhibit L. The committee is recommending that policies 3170, 8120, and 5580 be moved forward for second reader. And I also want to bring to your attention that section 7424.1 of the educational article requires that each county board submit its revised bullying, harassment, or intimidation policy uh, to the state superintendent by January 1, 2017. That would be our policy 5580 that we're asking you tonight to move forward for second reader. Um, however, to meet that January 1, 2017 deadline, uh, PRC is also asking that the board waive third reader and actually be prepared to vote on policy 5580 at its uh, next meeting, December 6, 2016. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Um, then I would ask if I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee. It's been moved. Uh, is there any discussion at this time? Ms. Miller? We're going to um, skip a third reader. Uh, will we have opportunity for board member comment at second reader? Yes. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, between now and next meeting, if you can submit that information, if you have any comments. Okay. But, but when we do second reader, I mean, are we doing second and well, third simultaneously? How does that work? Yes. yes. Essentially, yes. that's exactly what's going to happen, but only for policy 5580. Thank and we would certainly want to make provisions so that people would have the, the opportunity to submit them early and also discuss them before we have to vote. All right. 
So if there's no further discussion, all in favor of moving the policies forward, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you very much, Ms. Williams and PRC. Uh, so our next item, um, item M, is new business report on the FY16 CAFR and single audit. Uh, for that, I'd ask Mr. Saris to come forward. Yes, uh, we uh, met with the audit committee of the board last month and the um, audit manager from Clifton Larson Allen to discuss the report. And I uh, wanted to present it tonight for your acceptance, noting that on uh, page two, uh, 22 of the CAFR, um, the opinion paragraph, uh, our auditors uh, have uh, affirmed their opinion that these financial statements fairly present the financial position um, of the board's uh, activities and funds uh, in all material respects. Um, I would uh, also direct your attention um, to the uh, separate document, the single audit, uh, on page one of which uh, the auditor, uh, Clifton Larson, uh, found no um, deficiencies in, in internal control that represent any material weakness. Uh, on page three, uh, the opinion paragraph at the bottom of that page uh, indicates that Clifton Larson Allen uh, has determined that in all material respects we have complied with uh, reporting requirements of all our major federal grants. Um, and uh, finally at the bottom of page four and top of page five, um, the auditor's opinion is expressed that the schedule of expenditures of federal awards is also uh, fairly stated in all material respects um, and ask uh, simply that you ex accept this report and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Saracen. I don't know that we have to vote to accept it, but this is an opportunity for board members if they have any questions or comments or thoughts uh, to ask uh, Mr. Saris, but it is a positive response to our, our systems here, and we, we are, are glad to see receive the report. Um, any questions at this time? If not, I think uh, that's all we need, Mr. Saris. Thank, Thank you, you, you very much. All right. Moving ahead, um, this is um, the uh, section of our meeting where we get board member comments. And I think if we don't mind, I'm going to start with Ms. Johnson and let Mr. Collins close this. So we'll just move around and uh, mm -hmm. go in that direction if I could. Ms. Johnson, do you have anything for us tonight? I actually don't have anything prepared. I did. And I just oh. wanted to thank um, all of the parents, teachers, um, students, uh, members of the public that came out tonight to speak um, for a public comment came out to just watch the board meeting um, in general and so thank you for everybody's input today. I would also like to tell my seatmate that I will miss him very much that he um, <laughs> I will I actually will we have I know it's much to the dismay of everybody else we have he has side comments with me, and I try not to participate in them. <laughs> um, he, but he has truly taught me a lot about, um, about policy, about being a leader and being a follower when, need it, when I need to. And um, he's a friend, and I will, he will be missed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Ms. Miller? Yes, I also wanted to thank everybody who came out tonight, both inside and outside of the building, and uh, to... Uh, Thanks, Senator Collins, for his service, and uh, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you. Mr. Birch? You know, it seems like only yesterday I was a new entering sophomore at our Kenwood High School, home of the Bluebirds. And since that time, I thought I was done with Mike first graduating. And then there was the, <laughs> the time that followed, the whole Hutchinson-Rasmussen team 
Uh, there was the time I'd come back in there and do this and do that, and then I'd be off on my own, and then I'd be back around, and you know, like the other Michael says in one of the Godfather movies, just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. And here it is, 45 years later, Mike, and we're still at it for at least a few more minutes. Mike, uh, it's, it's been quite a ride. Our friendship will continue. Uh, I know I can always pick up the phone and you'll tell me what you think as much as I have disagreed with you over those 45 years, I think I agree with you that the time has come to get out of the way, Mike. <laughs> uh, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thank you, Mr. Virch. Mr. Stewart. Well, I spent many hours preparing my comments for Mr. Collins, but <laughs> um, I just want to say in this time of Thanksgiving, the things that I'm grateful, grateful for, the first is for the members of this board. Uh, last week, I learned that you all made a donation to Kids Helping Hopkins in honor of my mother, Marcia Stewart, uh, who recently passed away, and that was a very touching gesture. So thank you for that and for the individual, individual gestures that you have made along with the members of this administration. Uh, I am grateful for Senator Collins. Okay. This board and our system was better for having had his service and his insights and advocacy will be missed. Uh, no doubt, as Abby said, it's about Tuesday nights, but it's also about meeting with parents and teachers and visiting schools and engaging with students and working late nights and developing proposals. And uh, you did those, th those things very well. You've kept an open mind, you fought for results and you have been a mentor to me, and I hope you will continue to provide me uh, advice, but for some reason, I bet you were going to anyway. <laughs> so I appreciate that. And finally, I am grateful that we have a superintendent and staff and teachers who believe in the promise of all students. And this is a system that's committed itself to equity, that elevated this principle and has worked to make it so. Uh, in this time, we need equity, we need diversity, and nowhere is that more important than in our schools. It leads to better grades, better outcomes, and a better understanding of one another. This is our system. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank Ms. Eaton. I, vis I visited several schools in the Dundalk and Essex area during the American Education Week. I was very pleased to see many student-centered classrooms where students were taking charge of their own learning. Many were working in small groups and they had the choice to work with their device or use a book. It was about 50-50 split in several schools. There were many different types of products being produced by the students, such as some students were creating posters, others were writing poetry, while others were reading their novel aloud or creating a science project. Many teachers had small groups of students and were getting them ready for their redos. The teachers reviewed the students' work we taught a particular concept, then the students were ready to try again. So many neat things were taking place, but I especially liked Edgemere Elementary gym, gym class <laughs> and their Scooter City. Students received play money from a bank, hopped onto their scooters and demonstrated their muscular strength, coordination, and knowledge of traffic laws and signals, all while spending their money for gas, a car wash, bowling, and much more. This was a great cross-curricular lesson which incorporated many skills. Thank you to all the principals and assistants who took time out of their busy schedules to show me around their school. I could hear their pride in their words and see their pride in their eyes whenever they spoke about their school. BCPS is blessed to have such dedicated principals assistant principals and teachers. And my last thought, I do not have a Twitter account, therefore I do not tweet. <laughs> but if I could, I would like to retweet the words of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Williams? Well, I want to say thank you to Mike Collins for his friendship and for his service on the board. 
I want to bid you a fond farewell and Godspeed for another, let me see, hmm, 50 years of living and loving life. And um, thank you for advocating for the underrepresented. Um, secondly, I was on a planned vacation um, last week during American Education Week, celebrating my husband's birthday, um, November 14th, so I was not able to attend our schools. Um, so instead, I participated in a Dr. Seuss cat in the hat parade and a green eggs and ham breakfast uh, with several young people uh, who were on the cruise with their parents. And I just want to share that, you know, I think this world is going to be okay. Our hands are in, our future uh, is in really good hands. These kids were thoughtful, smart, loving, and caring. And it was truly uplifting for me. Um, I also want to just again, thank Abby and TAPCO and our teachers and administrators. I am a very strong supporter of our teachers. I firmly believe I would not be where I am today if it had not been for really loving and caring teachers that I had throughout my entire public education. And I really recognize and applaud the many sacrifices that our teachers make for our children's education. Um, lastly, I, well, no, before I say lastly, I do want to remind everyone that PRC's next meeting is December 12th, and it is a public meeting, and the public is always welcome to attend. And I do want to just share, just in case anyone is taking note, that PRC was actually the first committee that was open to the public. Mm -hmm. um, but lastly, um, I do want to wish everyone, all of my board members whom I, who I really do love, I love each of you, I cherish, cherish each of you, I value each of you, and though we all have differences, we are similar in so many more ways, wonderful ways. And um, have a healthy and blessed Thanksgiving. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Ms. Causey? Thank you. I'll start off also with Senator Collins. Uh, I wanted to thank you for all the times that you were the voice of community concerns when it seemed no one else was. And I want to thank you for your support for me personally and for the new board members and for the gift of your unique personality. And that's a compliment. <laughs> and you will be missed, but I look forward to hearing what you're doing and who else you're talking to. Um, on that note, I want to say that I also enjoyed American Education Week, and I'm not going to tell you everywhere I went, because you already told me you don't want to know. Um, but I did visit several schools, and it was great to meet more teachers, administrators, support staff, building operations staff. Um, I did visit, you know, high schools and uh, middle schools and elementary schools. Um, one of the, uh, I, I went to two amazing ones that I will tell you about, and one was uh, to hear African-American historian Lewis Diggs speak at Milford Mill, and he has his own website, lewisdiggs. it's either .org or .com, but um, he uh, grew up in Baltimore City, he's been living in Baltimore County all of his life, and he spoke to ROTC students at Milford Mill Academy, and he was speaking about his time in the, um, I want to say the Maryland Guard when it was segregated. And these teachers, I mean, these students in this classroom just couldn't understand. They, I mean, they just didn't know what that meant. So he explained to them, and then he explained to them after he came back from the Korean conflict um, and then was able to um, continue education. And then now he's a historian and has worked for the community to preserve buildings and photos and history. He's written books. It's just, it was just really amazing. And it's so important for us to uh, learn from other people who lived through things that we didn't and appreciate what we can, how we can grow from that. Um, the, the next amazing thing I'm going to have to tell you is uh, the grade four students at Stonely Elementary School um, benefited from a wonderful visit 
from uh, Mr. John Stokes, who was a civil rights activist, and the teachers researched him as part of a learning from first person, and they invited him to come share his story. And it was really incredible because as a high school student, he organized a strike for his high school to, um, to combat the notion that separate but equal was fair and legitimate. And so they, the high school was closed for five years while they, the students hired an attorney and they um, became a part of Brown versus Board of Education. There were five schools that were in that Supreme Court case, which was so pivotal to all of the progress that we've made in education in America. Um, and it was based on facilities. So it was just incredible to hear his story. He also has a book um, called um, Students on Strike, I believe, and it was just fascinating. And I commend the um, teachers and the, the um, administrators at Stonely Elementary School for that. And then the last thing I'll say is, next to last thing I'll say, is uh, ended the uh, week with football Friday night lights and then also robotics on Saturday. Um, but one of the highlights was I have to thank food and nutrition because one of the funnest things I did was sit at a table full of first graders and eat a Thanksgiving feast and have strawberry milk. So that was fantastic and um, a highlight and it's good to know how well our children are eating in school. Um, and then I'm just gonna say a few things about how I really hope as we move forward that the board and the superintendent and administration will really work on our responsiveness um, to the public, but also to the teachers, and also to our stakeholder groups like TABCO and CASE, where when we work together in the beginning, we can have better results with really, truly open communication. So I would just really um, advocate for that. And I'm gonna skip over some other things to end quickly, and I just wanted to give a couple quotes also, um, because I believe that equity is critical but equity does not mean agreement. It just means that everyone has a chance to express their point of view in a respectful way and to be received with respect. Humanity is but a single brotherhood, so make peace with your brethren. And that's from the Quran 4910. And lastly, I wanna finish with a brief part of a speech that my father attended back on August 28, 1963, and it was Martin Luther King Jr., I Have a Dream. And this note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation will, where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, and I think we all know that, <laughs> to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. So with that, I agree that I will do my part to continue to work together. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kazi. Mr. Yofel. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Mike, I'm, I'm going to miss you. I mean, I have no one to banter with anymore. <laughs> you're leaving like you're leaving me out there on an island by myself. Anyway, thanks a lot. You know, it's been a great run for the five and a half years, and I think we we did some really good things. Um, I, I know you don't want to hear about American Education Week, but you know, it, it's an, <laughs> I, I'm not. I went to a school. I spent about four hours uh, during the course of the week. And you know, here's what impressed me. Number one, um, these kids are amazing. I was in a fifth grade class, and I spent the whole hour on, uh, with, over a kid's shoulder while he was doing math. And I had never seen uh, the application of our devices to math. And it was really, really something special. And the kids working these problems and putting the answers in. Teacher comes around and said, you got the right answers, but that's not good enough. Put it down on pencil and paper how you got there. And I thought that was very impressive. Something else I learned, and, and this will go to all the critics who have been over here for the last couple of years talking about screen time. Unless you get into the school and actually stay there and watch these kids, you can understand that they're not overdoing screen time. As a couple of teachers told me, I guarantee you they're spending more time at home playing games on the screen than they are on the screen here in school. So I, I really don't want to hear any more comments about what either parents or others think that screen time is too much. I didn't see it all day. At the school I went to, they had our new innovation bus. Um, 
and I suggested that perhaps we bring it outside to a meeting for those who, who may not get to this um, project or having it at uh, Sandy, uh, one of the schools that just came out today. This bus is amazing. It, it's got more, more innovation, more things into it. I had a personal tour. And uh, and then I got booted out by a third grade class. But it, it, I, I mean, I could have played around with the printer and this, and it was really great. And when you see it, you're going to say that this thing is really neat. And so I said um, to Nick, is that his name, uh, Nick? Yeah. I said, look at all this. How much it cost us? He said, uh, truthfully, except for the painting, which was done outside, we did it all ourselves internally in the school system. And that goes for all the electrical, all the equipment. It was really amazing. So to the public, to our board, you got to get a tour of this bus. Mm -hmm. This is how t kids are learning in the future. Uh, screen time bus. OK, last Thursday night, I had the pleasure of attending mm -hmm. Northwest Academy for Health Sciences. Mm -hmm. This is our newest magnet program. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Dance and uh, the president of Northwest Hospital uh, were present and made the presentations. This was a pinning ceremony. And um, the first class in the health sciences at Northwest has 90 students, and there are 23 in the ninth grade at Randallstown. And the way the program has been developed, they will go from Northwest Academy to Randallstown, and in conjunction with Northwest Hospital, uh, will hopefully find jobs in the healthcare field. Um, and the hospital will accommodate them, as I understand it, uh, and perhaps jobs at the conclusion of their teaching. Um, I understand that next year they've already had 450 applications for a class of 90. Mm. Um, the, the, the parent support there was incredible. The community loves the whole idea, and, and as uh, Dallas said, that if this works out and all the kinks come out, They'll go to the east side. But this is really, um, as you said, healthcare, health sciences, and healthcare is really the major employer in the future for the next God knows how many years. So I think we're on the right path uh, in this magnet program. It, it really is great. You can say the rest. Thank you, Mr. Young. Huh? I, you know, again, I'll just be brief again. Um, I did have the opportunity over the weekend to as attend a retreat with the Maryland Association of School Boards, and one of the pieces of information I left with that stuck with me that in the last year and a half, the board members across the state have changed to the point we have about 50, almost 50 percent new board members. So uh, in that time, we've lost a lot of institutional knowledge and practices that uh, people that have served on boards a long time had. And that's one of the things that Mr. Collins has brought to us, I think, kept us out of some trouble over the years. And I've, as I've said to him directly, during the time on the board, he had the boldness to say some things that I wasn't quite ready to say. So I appreciated his uh, directness and forthrightness, and I think it has improved us as a board, and we will miss his knowledge and perspective. I told him I'm going to stay in touch, so I'm not really saying goodbye yeah. at this time. So you'll hear from me over the years, but thank you again for who you are and what you've done for us. That's it. Thanks, Chuck. As Thanksgiving is upon us, and if we all up here keep talking, Thanksgiving will be upon us. <laughs> it, it, uh, <laughs> no, we're not. No, we're not, because you already talked. <laughs> it's, uh, <clears throat> I know, that was a hint. That was a hint. It's, uh, it's my wish. It's my wish that uh, we put individual platforms, we as a board, put individual platforms behind us and, they would, and that we put students before us. Um, and it's important that we all remember uh, the values that are common to all of us because there is way too much that is in common uh, for us to be spending time on individual platforms. Um, so uh, that's my Thanksgiving wish. And Mike, thanks for not only loving Baltimore County, but loving Baltimore County students. Ms. Brett? Yes, I just have a really, really brief comment um, to Mr. Collins. Um, I know I've only known you a fraction of the amount of time that all the rest of the board members have, but in that time, despite disagreements, 
I've never doubted your absolute dedication to students, so I would like to thank you on behalf of all the students of Baltimore County for your dedication. Thank you, Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. And Mike, you get to close the site this evening. I will really, I will really, I really, I really will be brief this time. First of all, I want to thank, <laughs> I want to thank you all for your most generous comments. Um, it has been a, a wonderful privilege, and as I said in my remarks before, I'll leave it to others, you primarily, to evaluate the contributions I did or did not make. But I feel good about it, and it's nice to end a volunteer or professional paid task, and I've had the privilege of being able to do that in my career on your own terms in your own time. And I'm very blessed to be able to have done that. I consider this a great honor and privilege to be a, someone who served on the board, but it really is time now for someone else to sit here. But you guys and gals will be together for two more years. The board will be very stable until the elections to produce new board members in December of 2018. So you all have a lot of work to do and a lot of governing to do. And in my lengthy comments before, I really told you what I hope you will do. And I told Dr. Dance what I hope he will do. And I know that's his intention because he's already talked to me about it. So I was kind of really fudging a little because I knew the direction we were going to be going in anyhow. <laughs> but, but, um, mm -hmm. but, you know, we are a great system. We do pursue deliberate excellence, <coughs> and you are a great board. So happy Thanksgiving, and for the last time, good night. Thank you, Mr. Cowell. <laughs> Just a couple of informational items uh, included in the packet information tonight is a fund comparison of 2016 and 2017. Uh, just some announcements. Our next board meeting is Tuesday, December 6th here at Greenwood at 7 p.m. Schools are closed Thursday and Friday. Again, as we've talked for Thanksgiving, our meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much.